I'd like to welcome everybody to the special meeting of the Board of Trustees of East Central Independent School District being held on July 13, 2023, beginning at 5.30 at the Student Services Center. Can I have a roll call? Yes, sir. Amelia Carrasco? Here. Ginger Friesenhaus? Here. Victor Garza? James Mulkey? Bill Brazil is here. Monique Prince here. John Mexico. Thank you, Madam Secretary. We'll move on to item three, prayer and pledge. Mr. Connor, who do we have tonight? Mr. McKay, if you get started, excuse me. Absolutely. We pray your answer prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for this day, Lord. Lord, we just ask for some rain, Lord, and, and some relief. Lord, we just want to say thank you for these folks and the board that donate so much of their time and volunteer so much, but in the service of kids and for this community so grateful and humbled for their service. Lord, just continue to ask for wisdom and discernment as we make decisions and work together in order to continue to serve this great community. Lord, continue to bless us and bless us on our way home. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Please stand for the pledges. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to the Texas, one state, under God, one and indivisible. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the Texas, one state, under God, one and indivisible. Thank you, Mr. McKay. We'll move on to item four, public comments. No public comments. No public comments, and we will move on to item five, action agenda. Consideration and possible action to adopt resolution delegation emergency. Authority to the superintendent to enter in contract for construction services to repair damage due to unforeseen flooding in East Central High School main gym and waive the requirements under Chapter 44 of the Texas Education Code due to the emergency situation pursuant to the Texas Education Code 544.031 and 44.0312. Mr. Scott. Sir, trustees, unfortunately, a couple weeks ago, uh, we came uh, back to work on a Monday and noticed flooding in the engine. They had a <coughs> pipe that had burst, actually a fitting, that had burst in the ceiling in the mechanical room above um, so, uh, the water heaters in the gymnasium. Those water heaters were <coughs> brand new and replaced as well as all the fittings and piping in the mechanical room, but overhead uh, where we had some aged pipes, one of those fittings had a pinhole, and uh, I mean literally a pinhole, uh, and it shot through the um, gypsum board overhead above the CMU block and we don't know for how long but long enough for a little pinhole of, of, of a leak to, work, to run a hole through the wall, go into the locker room, pour down the stairs, flood the floor um, and so we had to immediately act. Um, so fortunately under circumstances like that um, even though contracting for that kind of work would exceed $50,000, uh, which would necessitate board approval uh, under these emergency circumstances, given that um, you, know, you have to do mold remediation and prevention and uh, all of those things, get the floor up, dry the floor, and, uh, get rid of all the you know, sheetrock up the walls three feet in the locker room, and that had to happen immediately. Uh, you know, I went ahead and authorized that. What I'm bringing to you tonight is it under Chapter 44, uh, having done that, it requires board to retroactively authorize uh, those um, contract awards uh, that, that I've already submitted. And um, so I'm glad to report that uh, we, we did not have any asbestos, we did not have any mold. Um, our roofing company, Cavalry, is a construction company that does a wide range of things. Uh, they had the ability to deploy team immediately. Um, to get the floor lifted, to remove all of the damaged wall panels, uh, to bring crews in to get all of the water extracted, um, and the job's moving right along. So we've got a flooring contractor uh, ready to go. We expect, I believe, for him to start next week. I believe so. Um, and uh, so the, the volleyball teams uh, and the programs at the high school have made some adjustments. Uh, there, there will be about a 50 day period that it will take to get that floor replaced. Uh, it is covered by insurance. Um, our district's deductible on our insurance policy is about $25,000. Uh, it's about a half million dollars worth of that. So uh, there will be, uh, everything will be restored back to original condition and the floor will be brand new to include the 
subfloor. So there's a subfloor on those wood floors. It's pretty intricate. Um, as well as the moisture barrier. The moisture barrier that was there, the original moisture barrier, and at that time the technology they used was roofing tar paper. Um, so they've got much better technology um, today that they put in the floors, and we'll be getting that. I'll be happy to answer any questions about that. So, go ahead. I was just curious, are we going to, um, of course we'll continue the insurance policy, but will it be different now that it's different uh, people that are putting in this and it's new and will it be, have to be covered for more? Is there anything going to change in that respect? So the policy is, uh, is, is, is about as good a coverage as you can get for, the, for the, that particular kind of condition. The flooring contractor is the same guy that services all of our floors and resurfaces um, all of the wood floors in the district annually. And so he's been doing work, uh, he's been doing work for us on our gym floors for years. He's the guy uh, around the state, is um, the go-to guy, uh, has the expertise and, and the good value. <coughs> so I think our insurance is adequate. We're pleased with uh, the coverage that we've got uh, and how this has unfolded as far as the CASB support um, in that claim. And the contractors that have been doing the work have been exceptional. Good. Thank you. The question I had was, is how deep could you talk into the three foot of the replacement right mm -hmm. I mean, did it hit that? So in the coach's it? office and on the boys' side, the, the, in the coach's office, I mean, I don't think the gym is leaning, uh, but I think it was the, mat, the, the a matter of the direction the water was flowing, and it found the stairwell on that side is the path of the least resistant. The, the highest water was about three inches oh, wow. in, in the coach's office. The, and it migrated down to the floor, and then outside of the coach's office, there was water, you know, one between one to three inches towards the showers. It didn't get over to the girl's side. It didn't get to the elevator on the um, opposite side of the gym where the uh, uh, season ticket holders are. The, uh, mm -hmm. that, it didn't get on that side. It just really was isolated to the coach's, male's coach's office down the stairwell, so any of the sheetrock and wall panels, you know, up into that area, you know, had water damage up three, four inches, of course it absorbed it, so the, the standard protocols go up, I think, about three feet, and they should yeah. move it off, and then dry it out immediately into that uh, the mold. Mm -hmm. Oh, that floor. So that particular floor, I believe we had 16 years ago. Yeah, so that was, the original floor uh, was there, until 16 years ago. Mm -hmm. 16 years ago it was replaced. So and they got rid of it all or? Nope, so we salvaged all of the panels that did not have, that weren't already warped. Mm -hmm. So on the um, boys locker room side, most of that had already popped and warped. When you get about half court back towards the girls locker room side, uh, and, partic and in particular to the, the, the main bleacher side, that kind of quadrant mm -hmm. was in pretty good shape. So we took all that out. We also were able to cut out the whole pieces that had the Hornet logos. Mm -hmm. We've got uh, a couple of pallets and maintenance that where we've got those dried out, stacked, covered. Um, we just wanted to have options for repurposing those things. And, and so. maybe, yeah, making cutting boards or, you know, or whatever, yeah. signs. Yeah. Uh, maybe even repurposing some of that flooring in some athletic offices or something. But yeah. we, did, we were able to salvage quite a bit. The, yeah. our, our maintenance team did the best they could get as much as they could. That makes a nice floor. Yeah. Really? Some yeah. Nice yeah. Control control or something. That's good enough. Oh, one last question on the, uh, you said it was the older plumbing, so did, are they going to go through that? So yeah, we're going to have them, re we're going to have them go through all of it and evaluate it all and make some recommendations about how far back should we go in replacing all of it. Gotcha. Um, I mean, it was literally a coupler right above everything that was replaced. Uh, I mean, a nipple, if you will. And uh, just failed. Yeah. 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 Uh, President, I recommend the board adopt a resolution as presented to delegate emergency authority to the superintendent to address the unforeseen flooding of the Central High School main gym including waiving competitive procurement requirements under Chapter 44 of the Sex Education Code, and delegating authority for the superintendent to contract for construction services to address emergency repairs to East Central High School's main gym. 
and ratifying contracts entered into by the superintendent for the emergency repair. We have a recommendation from the superintendent for a resolution for emergency procurement under code 44.031 and 44.0312. Do I have a motion? So moved. I have a motion from Moody Priestess. Do I have a second? Second. I have a second from Ginger Friesenhahn. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Motion carries. With that, we will move on to item six, trustee, trustee workshop 6.1, goal setting workshop. Mr. Scott. So the trustees will, will be bring a couple of workshops to you this evening. Um, uh, we're going to start with goal setting. Uh, we've got our three big departments represented tonight. We'll come in instruction, uh, business operations, support services, and student community engagement. And we'll provide the board with an overview of where we're going um, at, at a high level. And uh, our, our intentions tonight are to make sure the board feels comfortable, that we're addressing the things that we need to address, and that we're heading in the right direction. Um, there's no action necessary, um, just um, some input, possibly, um, some clarification uh, uh, on our part to the board, and that will allow us to then finalize our district improvement plans as well as our campus and department improvement plans, which we will be bringing back uh, in, in a subsequent meeting for your consideration and approval. So this is kind of, we're getting close, this is the rust draft, but it's getting pretty close to final. We just kind of want uh, a nod tonight that we're headed in the right direction. As far as the budget workshop, which we'll hold uh, together with this, uh, the budget workshop is going to be um, familiar to you, uh, but the difference will be that we have very limited information at this time, given that there, the legislators are still in special session and haven't made any decisions. Um, so we'll bring to you tonight our assumptions and uh, clarity given the limited information we had at this time to give the board a pretty good idea of the direction that our budget's heading. And, and again, we'll finalize that budget when we have the information we need and bring that back to the board uh, for consideration and possible approval. So with that, um, in your packet you have a um, hard copy. You can go on and follow along with it. That's the slide deck that we'll be using. And the first slide basically refers to our continuous growth process. As you'll recall, um, the continuous growth process is the method that we use, the system that we use across the organization to take the board goal, um, to provide an exceptional learning um, environment for every child, every minute, every day. Uh, we formalize this process to enable us to use the data that we have to identify opportunities and ultimately prioritize the work that we need to, to undertake going forward to make the progress that the community expects, that the board expects. And um, so just a reminder that this is coming from this process uh, that we've been undertaking throughout the entire spring to prepare us to <coughs> this point today across the organization. And then in the next slide, you'll see our cascade, our goal cascade, because our, our effort through this process was to ensure that there was alignment um, and that basically every school um, and every department and every sub department is taking that board goal through that discipline process, identifying our highest level goals, our annual results measures, if you will, and then cascading their contributions, their focuses in ensuring that they're contributing to helping the system accomplish the goals. So there's alignment, the goal, and the, and the work cascade throughout the entire organization, and everybody's fingerprint is on the work, and we're all moving in the same direction. And so with that, we'll start with curriculum and instruction. And, and I do want to uh, remind the board that we, we're coming off two days of leadership. Uh, our team has been working extremely hard. I promise you they're, gonna, they're probably on their way home, and before the sun goes down, they're going to be asleep because they're exhausted. <laughs> we had a, a curriculum instruction retreat earlier this week. Uh, our other departments have been also doing the work staging the year. So mm -hmm. we, well, thank you for that. we've already begun to operationalize a lot That's of this awesome. work. That's awesome. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, President Mackinac and Mr. Sana, Board of Trustees. So, like Mr. 
Donna said, we have been focusing on this work, especially in the last three days, to really make sure that uh, campuses, departments have really good, robust plans and feel very confident and clear about the direction that we're going and have um, strategies and actions to really back up what those plans and goals are going to be. So I'm going to talk to you and share with you this curriculum instruction and assessment plans. So I'm going to talk to you about priority one, teaching and learning. And we have um, one, we have four goals, but one really overarching goal that the other three goals really nest underneath. And that goal is to um, get a tier higher in our state um, uh, accountability. And with that, um, we are going to focus on four main strategies. So we're looking at high quality lesson planning classroom visits and coaching, instructional leadership, and then curriculum documents and um, resources. So we spent a lot of time over the last couple days talking about these four things. So high quality lesson planning, we have talked about that we are going to either be providing teachers with high quality instructional materials and resources, um, which kind of go with the first two. So with that, we talked about protocols and resources and how to help teachers um, either take the lesson plan that's given to them so that they, they're given a lesson plan that's already written for them that's aligned with state standards and helping them internalize that lesson plan or taking a high quality instructional material and writing a um, lesson plan that's aligned to it. So they'll have two options based on what's, what's, what they're, what they're uh, given. And so we talked about what those what those strategies are going to be and how we will set up their planning process to help them be successful with that. So we spent a lot of time on practicing that today, talking about the protocols, having exemplars for that, and um, setting up those systems for teachers to be super successful with that. And then once teachers plan together and they um, have their high quality instructional lessons, then instructional leaders go and do classroom visits. So the purpose of classroom visits are to go in and out and to make sure that teachers are um, comfortable teaching what they're teaching, have the resources that they have, and then provide them with feedback and support um, to make sure that students are learning at the highest level possible and then also make sure that teachers are continuing to learn and grow. So that partnership is there between um, the admin and the teachers. So that cyclical process of teaching and learning and I'm there to work with you to help you continue to learn and grow so teacher, that students, our students thrive. So we talked a lot about what that process is going to look like for classroom visits and coaching and being alongside those teachers. That instructional leadership team, every campus has identified instructional, uh, the admin who are on their instructional leadership team. That instructional leadership team meets once a week and their purpose is to really look at the data and um, how the campus functions as a whole, both um, instructionally as well as management and operation to make sure that all is on um, meeting goals, everything is working the way it's supposed to be. And if it's not, that they're doing a very quick assessment and course correcting along the way. So that if they see something that is happening that's supposed to be and it's working well, then they are celebrating that and that they're replicating and making sure that they continue to do that. If there happens to be something that's not happening that, that should be, that they're meeting together, talking about what's happening, and then coming up with a quick action plan to monitor and adjust. So that's the purpose of the instructional leadership team. And then um, we have curriculum documents and resources. And as you guys, we shared last year, we went, under, we went through an audit um, that came in, and one of the things they said was, we are, we are uh, resource rich. Our, our district is very lucky. We have a ton of resources. It is a blessing and a curse, right? Because sometimes when you go to a buffet, you know, there's so much to choose from, you get overwhelmed and you don't know what to eat, right? So you want, you want to eat everything, but you can't pick all of it. So we worked really hard this summer to kind of narrow down what are the most important things out of those resources that our teachers need. So we have gone through each content area and we have prioritized what out of those resources are the most important resources that teachers need to choose from and or utilize. Um, and so there won't be so much confusion and so much, so much overwhelming um, choice for them as they get in there. 
There is some choice and some latitude still, but it's not an entire buffet. So, um, and then we also went across all documents to align them to make sure that they are the same in format, in, in look, so that if I'm a, a teacher and I'm looking at science or social studies or um, any content area, they all look the same and um, so I don't get confused in format or all that. So it's user friendly. So we worked really hard to work on that um, and, feel, and continue to also add to it. So that's our goals. Those are our overall goals for this year. So new programs. We've talked to you about these, but we have some updates. I just want to kind of remind you about what we're doing this year as far as um, across the district. We have our STEM Academy opening at PD. We're super excited about that. Um, we have P-TECH that we're adding at the high school um, that will be adding ninth grade. So that will be, we have about 100 students that will be um, in that program um, starting this fall. Very excited about that. We're adding 12th grade to Cass Lee, so we'll have our first graduating class in Cass Lee this year. Um, so that will round out and make that um, campus whole. So we're very, very excited about that. We're looking at our choice schools. So we have choice schools at the elementary school. When we look at Salado Leadership Academy, we have the Dual Language Academy, and then we have STEM. And then we have, um, at the high school, we have now have P-TECH, and we have Cass Lee. We don't have anything at the middle schools. So there's an opportunity there. So one of the things that we're exploring and that we added this year is we added sixth grade to the Leadership Academy. Because what we are hearing from our students is they want still choice if they get to the middle school. So that gap between sixth and eighth grade and ninth grade is an opportunity for us to look at programming. So we added sixth grade this year. We did a survey um, about late fall, early spring last year to our students who are currently in those choice programs to say, who's interested? Are you interested in middle school? Because we weren't really sure if that was a need or something that they wanted. And so we got enough interest to have one class. So we opened one class of sixth grade. We um, started with the kids that were there and then we opened it up to others to see if any would be interested. And so we, we were able to open one classroom at the sixth grade leadership academy. And so we're gonna, we're gonna pilot that this year to see how that goes. It's gonna be housed at Salado, but it's going to partner with Legacy so that students will um, be a part of Salado, but they'll be able to participate in programs and at the middle school at Legacy. So because they have the good fortune of being super close and being able to utilize those resources and, and programs. Um, but we are also looking at um, this year um, opportunities for middle school and just exploring what, what could it look like at middle school and we potentially bringing to you some options about if sixth grade goes well and the students seem to like it, what could that look like if we want to explore something in the middle school area. So that's an exciting thing. And then on our outdoor learning journey, um, we are going to continue building out our outdoor learning so that each campus is a beautiful outdoor learning, which is such a phenomenal thing. So we're going to be adding Oakcrest and Highland Forest. So we're, we're very excited about that. Now, right now we have Sinclair. Um, we just finished Salado and Harmony. And so um, we'll round out with five of them that will be finished. So very excited about that. So one of the great opportunities Hello, that school we board. have. My name is Mike Rack. I'm the Commissioner of Education for the state of Texas. And I am a former school board. Hold on. Oh, okay. Hold on. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Oh, Mike. Yeah. I'm giving you a special treat tonight. You can thank you later. <laughs> okay. So one of the things I wanted to give you an update on is our new accountability system from TEA is a special gift to us for this year. Um, so uh, it is coming out and we are going to be receiving our first ratings this um, September. And so I wanted to just give a very brief update on what is coming and what are some of the changes so that you know when ratings come out and when we start to get some of that information, what, what it would entail. So um, Commissioner Morath has a, a very um, interesting interesting Here's a, here's a message for specifically for you that we're going to play. So I'm going to play this in about four minutes. Hello, school board members. My name is Mike Rack. I'm the Commissioner of Education for the state of Texas, and I am a former school board member. I served on the Dallas board for four and a half years. 
and uh, school board service is critical. When you think about the role that you play in our republic, uh, you are where the buck stops, the governing body of the local school district. And uh, you are responsible for how well those schools work, and how well we serve collectively all five and a half million souls in Texas public schools across the state of Texas. Thank you for your work. It is hard, daunting, and the pay is pretty terrible uh, for a school board member. So uh, thank you uh, for your work. Uh, uh, one of the things that I reflect on as a former school board member, one of the responsibilities that I held, was I needed to know how well our schools were doing in, in Dallas. Were they the same? Were they getting better? Were they getting worse? Uh, and because it was my job to oversee our administrative team and make sure that we were making progress for kids. And uh, so what uh, the agency does, what TEA does, to try to um, help improve uh, your ability to govern your school district is we provide eight threat ratings, which then gives a summative evaluation of all of your schools. And so every year when eight threat ratings come out, you can take a look at the ratings, you can then compare them to last year, and you can say, are my schools getting better, are they about the same, are they getting a little, a little worse, and you can then help build action plans uh, with your administrative team accordingly to support our kids. And the, uh, what, what has been true for AthRef for the last five years, since, really since 2017, is it's been basically the same system. The cut points have been basically the same, the mechanics have been basically the same. The, we, we evaluate schools holistically on the better of student proficiency or student growth. Um, as, as you all well know, evaluating schools is complex. Uh, our little humans are very, uh, very complex creatures, and so trying to get a single picture of performance is difficult, but AthRef does that very holistically. Uh, and the fact that it has remained unchanged since 2017 is also super helpful because you can then look at this year's results, your teachers can look at this year's results, your parents can look at this year's results and see, you know, is the school getting better? Uh, what, what kind of progress are we making for kids? It was not always like that in Texas with the um, school rating system. Before the eighth draft system, the agency, the way TEA worked, would tweak the ratings every single year. That they basically raise cut scores ever so slightly every any given year. And that was good in terms of setting goals that are constantly higher and helping us uh, push forward for kids. But it made life really confusing as a school board member in Dallas uh, in my old life because I would have a hard time figuring out, you know, are last year's results the same or better than this year's results? Uh, but, but the downside of what we've done over the last five years is we, we do want to constantly get better for kids. We want to make sure that our, uh, we are setting higher and higher goals. In fact, uh, the statute that sets up ATRF requires us to con continuously increase cut scores to ensure that Texas is a national leader in preparing kids for post-secondary success. So this year we are refreshing the ATRF rating system. The, uh, we will be using the information that we've gleaned over the last um, five years, all the feedback that we get from educators, from parents and others, um, to update uh, the way the ratings work. Um, and what that also means is that the ratings that you look at this year cannot be easily compared with last year's ratings. Uh, there's a few places uh, where cut scores are actually changing, in some cases going up, and so it will, it will no longer lead to an apples to apples comparison. So to try to make life easier for you, uh, what we are doing is we're publishing preliminary what-if ratings using last year's data, but using the new rating system um, uh, calculations. And so that way when ratings come out this fall, you will be able to, to look at, compare this year's uh, uh, actual ratings with last year's sort of hypothetical what-if uh, calculation ratings. And that way you can have a good apples-to-apples -apples comparison on performance. We're going to also put those uh, hypothetical what-if ratings up on texasschools.gov so that when parents or teachers or anybody in the community looks to evaluate year-over-year -year, uh, performance, they can compare this year's performance with last year's performance using this year's metrics. And um, uh, so we hope that this helps make the job that you have as a school board easier um, and, but it's also going to be important for all of us to kind of communicate about this to make sure everybody's on the same page. So we'll be communicating more about this in the fall when ratings come out. We have provided your superintendent with uh, uh, hypothetical what, what are preliminary what if ratings so they can go over those with you. And, and um, uh, there's a lot more details if you want to get into the, uh, the mechanics of it. Uh, we have all that information on our website, provided that information to your superintendent. But I wanted to uh, just talk to you directly about these changes because I knew that this would be important for me as a former school board member, and uh, hope that this is valuable for you. Thank you for your work. Thank you for the service that you do for our kids. School boards are critical to uh, 
on the foundation of our democracy and to highly functioning school systems. God bless you for what you do. So, um, here's some of the headlines that we that have been in the newspaper recently around uh, the concerns that public schools have uh, with the new ADA ACRS accountability system. So, there's a lot of unrest around what's coming, and they have not released a lot of information around cut scores or what that's going to happen. In fact, most of the scores right now still have what they call a zone of uncertainty, which they've blocked off about most of the scores um, that we've gotten, and it just says uncertainty. Like, zone, it is literally called the zone of uncertainty. We don't know what those scores are, are even contained. Um, so, we just, there's just not a lot of so, um, I, it always concerns me when people want to make my job easier. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, what does this really, really mean? I mean, you know, we've been talking, <laughs> what does this really mean for us? Huh. So, you know, if we, if, we, if we try to zoom out and try to get a, a, a handle on what, what, what's going on here, um, you know, we're in a legislative session, mm -hmm. there's a lot of political jockeying about vouchers and property tax relief and, you know, whether the legislature's going to add new money to the basic allotment and give teacher raises and that sort of thing. And we're in a special session. And the timing of when the new refresh is going to be deployed um, is seemingly going to intersect with the need for a narrative to suggest that schools are failing and that kids are getting they're making less progress. Um, and this new refresh, as the commissioner itself said, is going to change the standards and the cut scores. And all we know right now is this huge zone of uncertainty, meaning the vast majority of our students, we don't even know where, what that, they're in the zone of uncertainty. They're either going to pass, or they're either going to be the same, or they're going to do worse based on the new cut scores and the new standards that are going to change. It cannot be compared to any previous year unless we overlay a hypothetical very confusing set of indicators on old data to be able to try and make old data look like it can be compared to new data. Basically, go a whole, do a whole lot of framing a narrative that drives a political preference hmm. and leaving everybody frustrated and confused, yeah. especially the people that are trying to impact his life. And I just can't tell you how much easier that makes my job. Yeah. <laughs> so, the, happy, the good news is internally, we have several pieces of reliable data that we use mm -hmm. to determine the impact we're making on kids, the progress they're made, making, and the adjustments that we need to continue to make on behalf of individual kids, groups of kids, grade levels, and subjects. So we know internally the kind of progress we're making, and we'll be able to share that very clearly with you. In fact, in the, I'll, I'll go over the evaluation packet that kind of uses the data we have internally to, to demonstrate year over year kind of the impact we're making and the impact we need to continue to accelerate. Yeah. This, when it's decided, may or may not tell the same exact story because we can't control yeah. that. You know? I'm, I'm sorry, I just... Yeah. Yeah. And, okay. uh, and we apologize for sharing the video with you. <laughs> it's kind of an obligation. Um, it's a gift. It's a gift. Kind of falls in the category of don't don't hate the messenger. <laughs> right. <laughs> forgive, gonna, forgive the messenger. I'm gonna do just a real quick overview of what they are um, scoring, like what the domains are, just so you can kind of understand what how they've organized the new accountability system. So in domain one, it's all about student achievement. And underneath student achievement, you have three um, the three different levels. So elementary is all going to be star. So elementary, everything for their accountability is 100% star. Same thing for middle school. When you get to high school, that's where it changes. It's only 40% star, 40% CCMR indicators, and then 20% graduation. Then, and then when you get into 40% CCMR, that's where this all of this kind of goes into what could that be? So they could meet criteria on an AP. They could meet um, a TSI. They could complete a dual uh, credit course. 
or an associate's degree. So all of these things, if they do uh, these, then they will meet CCMR standard. So um, we track all of those and are working on beefing up all of those opportunities so students can show that they're CCMR ready in multiple ways. Domain two is all about student progress. So you have student achievement and then you have student progress. Student progress has two parts to it. One is about academic growth. So this is kind of interesting. Not that I completely understand it, but the, um, I thought that this sort of helped me understand it. So this is a sample student in third grade. So last year, let's say the year before, the student scored approaches, okay? And then this year, in order for the student to make academic growth and to be able to get student progress points and to demonstrate that, they would have to score of like almost on the above meets. So it's, they're making more than a year's growth. So instead of going from approaches to approaches, they have to go to approaches to meets. And that's how they would meet that indicator. So this would be like saying, this year you gotta run a six minute mile and you did it. Mm -hmm. And next year, you got to run a five-minute mile to be approaches again, but you wouldn't be considered a child that made adequate growth unless you run a four-minute mm -hmm. mile. See, so it's, it's not just about making the appropriate year's progress. Mm -hmm. It's about making the appropriate year's progress plus. plus. Yeah. Yeah, that's what that graph is showing. Yeah, yeah, right? So that's, that's how students will be scored for the individual. This is for the individual. Then you have relative performance, which looks at your economically disadvantaged percentage and your student achievement. So we, it'll look at all of how, how do all of our students that are economically disadvantaged line up. And based on where they, the percentage, like if we're at 65%, based on if we score 48%, we'd fall in a C. So it's kind of, it, it, it's all relative compared to where you are on the continuum of student economically disadvantaged, disadvantaged and then where your student achievement. So they come up with these, this graph and depending on where you fall within it, that's where you'll, you'll fall for part B. So there's two parts to the student progress. The individual and then the holistic, okay? Um, What's different? So holistically, I just wanted to just to step back for just a minute and just kind of go over, and there's a lot of things that are different, but I just want to point out some things that I haven't talked about. The first thing is just STAR in itself. This is the first year that we were required to test everybody online. So this year, everybody had to take the test online. Where before we had some paper, pencil. We, we've worked over the last couple of years to take as many kids online as possible. We, we already had a few, but we were required to take online, except for if they were arded and or had some sort of special requirement that, that they had to take paper pencil. So that was new this year, and that's a requirement of this new accountability system. Um, in CCMR, the, um, uh, the requirements there are that um, we had talked about this last year about the um, endorsements. And so we have two endorsements that um, did not, are not, that were eliminated that we will not be offering anymore. Um, and so that is part of this accountability. They looked at the endorsement list. They did away with some of the endorsements that were not, they did not see it in, uh, living up to the standards of industry ready. And so um, looking at that and then, just looking at my notes, those are the big ones. So that's, those, that's the kind of big one for that. And that, that just affected two of ours, um, OSHA and then the Google. And then the uh, closing the gaps, this one's kind of interesting. In the past, in order to have a sub pop, you had to have 25 students. So in order to have like a special student population, so um, whether that be uh, emergency, uh, emerging bilinguals or whatever, a, st a special population of students, you had to have 25 students in that group to make it. Um, they don't have that cutoff anymore. So now it has to be, it was increased to 10, which, which really, a lot of us, we have 10, so 25, it was harder to make, 10, so most of our students will count is what that means, it, that all sub pops count. Um, and then the last one is the district rating. Um, in the past, all of our campuses counted in the district rating as an average. They all counted equally. 
Um, that's not the case anymore. Uh, now campuses have more or less depending on their size. So if you look at tradition, they have more students than Con Valley. So tradition will count more in the district rating than Con Valley will. Where before, they both had equal weight in the district rating. That's the difference this year. So those are the, I just want to kind of give you just some general differences. So to recap, um, our instructional focuses this year that we went over, those are the things we talked about, the new programs that we're very excited about that we're adding, and then the new accountability system. Those are the, those are the big things that we're really focusing on and really working towards this year. Any questions or comments that you said I'd be happy to answer? I have one quick question. Absolutely. Um, pardon my, my ignorance, but on the... Uh, Where we picked the, a C or better, how did, how did we come up with a, a C or better? A C or better? Yes. So we have been a C in the past. Okay. And so our goal is to be where we are or be better. And so that's where we picked was that's where we've been and we want to maintain or be better. And, and with their grading system, if you will, actually a C is going to actually be a little higher. It will. Gotcha. So it will be a... So, so it will be a... It will be harder to, to get there. Yes, yes, yes. It made sense once you went on. I yes, on yes. Okay, thank you. We took the third grade science online at Region 20. Uh -huh. online. It was horrible. I mean, third grade was a long time ago. It was hard. But I should fill in the blank. Did they ever figure that out? If they misspelled that word, their answer, were they going to have several different options so they would count it and not so they have now, they have multiple things where they have not just multiple choice, but they have a fill in the blank and they have like a, a short answer. Um, and so they haven't um, given us a lot of information about scoring yet. Um, that's supposed to be coming out in August. So this is a, a, such, a it's such a complicated issue, right? So we, we've always taken the position of if we do really, really great things for kids and it's aligned to the standards that the state has set, that the kind of the testing takes care of itself because what, what the test is not is a criterion reference test, meaning the, the commissioner will claim that it is. But a criterion reference test is if you take biology, you're going to be tested on that exact content, mm -hmm. not be tested on a cross section of that content mm -hmm. in ways that you may or may not have been taught. You go take a driving test, you get the driving book, you study that, the questions are exactly from that book the way you study. Okay. This test is not intended to determine the degree to which you've mastered the, the criteria in the driving test. It needs to create a distribution of test takers from average, worst, you know, furthest from average to the bad and furthest from average to the good so we can compare. Right? So we can compare within the district and across districts. So that's less useful for us and for teachers because okay. if, if we administered the driving test from the driving book, we'd know how much of the driving book stuff we taught well. Mm -hmm. But we don't have that information. So we have to create additional data sources mm -hmm. that give us the whole picture so teachers are informed about the degree to which they've done a good job and the adjustments they make. Right. And so we know, are kids learning? Mm -hmm. are, are they getting smarter? Are they getting closer to where they need to be at the end of the, at the, at the line? Mm -hmm. um, and so... We've always, I don't want to say de-emphasize state accountability because we, do, we, we don't intentionally try to de-emphasize it because we do everything well, we'll make progress there. Um, but if we overemphasize it, we don't have useful information to make instructional decisions that are going to impact the work that teachers do with kids and ultimately outcomes for kids. So we got to keep it in its place as part of the whole story. The presentation tonight felt really heavy heavy and a heavy emphasis on state accountability. Um, and that's just because we're going through a recess. You guys are, we're, we're at a place where we're always, we feel like the dog's nipping at our heels and we're always chasing progress and it changes faster than we can make progress. And, and so we've just got this sense of urgency around getting really clear about our lesson planning our, and our instructional materials are really high quality and we're giving teachers what they need so that they can execute really well even if they're inexperienced. Um, that could be an experienced teacher is not an excuse. Everybody can't have a 30-year veteran in front of them. 
we've got to provide the resources that they need, and we need to be in the classroom with them, supporting them, like in real time, giving them, you know, in just in time coaching and support. We can't evaluate them later and say you needed to improve this, that, or the other. Um, and we need data, like we need quick data. We need to know every day that what we teach have the intended effect so I can make adjustments tomorrow. Um, and of course this start to really did to do that for us. Uh, and we need our instructional leadership teams really focused. Like they, they need to be really calibrated and focused in the effort of supporting teachers and building their practice and ultimately not missing a day of quality instruction for kids. And so those are, we're just really refining what we've been working on, getting more focused, more streamlined, more clear, in an effort to mobilize every teacher to do their best work. And we think that that's going to pay accelerating dividends on student outcomes as it relates to state accountability. But in the meantime, you know, hell, it might get refreshed in a couple of years again. You know, we don't know. Uh, but we know that every year we've got to get better. Right. At some point. But we are, though. Here. And we are. The ratings don't reflect yeah. that. And we are. And we're planting, so we're, we're cultivating seeds that are really building such yeah. strong foundations and systems that it doesn't really matter what happens in the future of accountability. Our kids are going to continue to thrive. Our teachers are going to have what they need. And we're going to be an excellent school system. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's what we're chasing. That's the long game. In the short game, we've got to do the best we can to, to get the immediate success we need in areas that matter the most. But, but we're not going to lose sight of building a school system that is reliable yeah. years into the future for all kids, no matter what changes are made. Right. So I, I wish it was less confusing, and I wish it was less complicated, uh, and I wish the commissioner didn't feel compelled to make our jobs easier. Right. Um, yeah. and the our shame is, is that we not. have to, because that rating system does not reflect what we're teaching our kids and how they're growing, but the shame is, is that we have to totally implement our own system within our school district to get a good beat on how far our kids are coming along. And the sh other second shame to that is that parents don't, community members, parents don't understand that we really do have that. And to not put so much weight in the A, B, C, D, E, F, because that is not a clear reflection of us. You know, I wish there was some way we could get that information out better that even though you know TA is, is judging us or, or, or grading us on this A, B, C, D, E, F, that that is not a real reflection of what's going on at ECISD. You know, we have had to create and go to our administrators and our leadership to implement a program that really does show what we're doing. But they only see the A, B, C, D, E, F. I mean, they, they eventually see it with yeah. us, you know what I'm trying to say? But that, that, that glare so much, oh my god, they got a D. You know, you know what, we, uh, what we find is, is parents, uh, families with children in the system um, have a better sense mm -hmm. of um, the quality mm -hmm. of their experience Absolutely. and worry less about the ABC. I hope they do. Um, we do. And it's those that, that no longer have kids in the system that don't yeah. know firsthand one way or the other to be confused by, yeah. well, last year it was this and this year it's this, but they don't understand what the commissioner. They weren't privy to the five-minute video just for you. Mm -hmm. And the commissioner saying, don't try to compare them. You won't be able to. They're not apples to apples. We had to keep raising the bar. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. unfortunately, that, those are the loud voices. And so I, I'm, I'm sorry you got started with, when you said make my job easy, I just wanted to go grab them and just, mm -hmm. I'll show you how to make my job easy. Yeah. But they, they, let us do what we do. And, 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 and our jobs are really easy when, I, when we all work together and get our kids to where we're trying to get them, get them to go. But in spite of all of that, and we heard, we heard this last year, we heard it the year before or whatever, all of the stuff, that the hoops you have to jump through just to prove that your kids are, are graduating, uh, uh, that, are, that, are, that are learning and are, are able to graduate the way that they did, and everybody jumps up and, and says, oh, how exciting about East Central with all of them. You see all of those, ac those accolades at the end, but then at the same time, you get all of this kind of stuff. So I'm gonna stop with right there and say, I am so excited that y'all are so excited about the new programs. <laughs> and I'm gonna to stay positive. <laughs> great things going on. You did. You have to like, very to her point, It's frustrating because you're like, can I defend why we are the brains, whatever we are. But I wish there was a resource like TA gives, you know, 
couple of clicks and you can see our ratings. And then that, to them, that reflects our district. Yeah. Instead of More digging deep, yeah. yeah, digging deep and going to our district website and seeing mm -hmm. everything, they just go to one spot and that's what they show them. But we know. Yeah, and that's true. Yeah. Shame. yeah, and that's why, I mean, we really wanted you to know because in the next, you know, month, two months, you're going to hear more about it and we wanted you to be informed about what it means, what's coming up, and what the narrative will be. So well, I appreciate all that. And, and I am grateful that we have the system yeah. that we have. Really what was released in July, will that change after the it hasn't released mess? Yet. Well, there so was it's coming in August, out. and then um, September is when, we'll, when the um, accounting will come out. So mm -hmm. it's great. So yeah. we'll get like preliminary scores, they said in, in August, but it won't be like a rating. We'll, we'll know, I think, with a zone of uncertainties will be, <laughs> I think, in August. Um, and then in September, we're supposed to So what's there. on there now is from what, last year? It is, but it doesn't tell us. It doesn't, it still says zone of uncertainty. You got the rate elementary. Rate, like the oh, that's last year. Yeah. Oh, There's okay. nothing on there from this year. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that'll be September. Uh, that'll be September. So I'm thinking it, this is this is awesome because it's helping me with, when I am able to talk to the community. Yes, that's coming. But is there anything that you can simplify or like say talking points for us? Mm -hmm. uh, I don't want to say dumb down because then I'm saying yes. dumb down. But like I'm, I'm, I'm using my uh, a cheat sheet, sheet. But yeah. in layman's term, where we can talk to the public that doesn't have or isn't privy to all this information, mm -hmm. and we can. Sound educated and sound. Yes. Give them uh, mm -hmm. what they need, and, and that way they don't have that negative perspective of mm -hmm. the scores. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? I yes. Make yes. Okay. Yeah, so we're going to have to work on that. Yes, yes for sure. I mean, there's still our parents that you can, uh, on our parents, some of, and I'm not trying to say I read, uh, you know, oh God, because it's social media or whatever. But you know, there are essential parents pages, and they yes, talk they about things like that. Okay. And a lot of sometimes people will come <laughs> on and say, oh gosh, mm -hmm. I wanted to. I wanted to bring my child to East Central, but did you see that scene? You see what I'm saying? And I know there's no way we can escape that stigma, but they, that's what they're doing, mm -hmm. is placing a stigma on us and a barrier, and it it just it just doesn't reflect what's going on. So I think it's irritating. Most of it is out of ignorance. It is. They don't it's know. just so, and they don't care. So and, and they don't care. I mean, I never wanted to bring a C home. Well, that's why I and asked I about did. what the C was, because <laughs> in my house, there was no C's allowed. Now, that's all I got in high school. Yeah, you know, so but automatically no. it's like bad, you know what I mean? The grading system is just a way of, you know, really setting you up for being judged, you know? Like, I, you know, John would know, he had F's all the time, <laughs> but I always had A's, so, you know. So we, we, we can definitely work on something. There's a page that, because we've been requesting of the agency for a while, you know, this is very like Dr. Fuller said herself, and I emphasize this is our this is our executive, or this is our chief academic officer mm -hmm. with a PhD who's mm -hmm. been doing this work in criminal instruction for almost 30 years. Okay, and she led a minute ago with, I kind of understand it, and I'll do the best I can. Okay, yeah. so that's yeah. just the reality. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, yeah. and so dumbing it down or whatever. I mean, don't yeah. feel like that's a self. So, uh, deprecating, yeah, but we're going to work on so maybe utilizing some of the resources to create some cheat sheets or talking points. But I also will say that in the evaluation packet, you know, in the in the first tab, there's some priority area, pro, uh, um, areas for improvement. And if you go to the academic piece, there's a page and a half that kind of summarizes mm -hmm. all of the things that we're doing strategically and tactically different mm -hmm. in curriculum instruction to move the needle. And then if you go into the third tab. We take in all of the data that we utilize it and aggregate it. And when this, this data, Jonathan, okay, and his team can correlate from one year to the next mm -hmm. and associate it to what SAR star scores look like to project with relative accuracy mm -hmm. how students have done. And, and so we've created a one pager for each of the four subject areas for you in there. And it shows last year, this year, and we simply put plus or minus. Plus, plus, if it was a big game, plus if it was a game, yes. you know, not a star if it was even, uh, you know, or a minus if yeah. it was a regression, and you're going to find almost zero minuses. And that's the so we best were, guess, based we, on... We were even at worst, and in most cases made progress. Yeah. Sweet. Grade for grade, subject for subject, yeah. um, from one mm -hmm. year to the next. Mm -hmm. And now, 
as I said, mid year. Does that mean we're making progress at the rate that we expect to? No, we want to go from a six minute model to a four minute model one year. And that's, in some places, that's what we need to do. Uh, but we still went from a yeah. five, you know, six minute model to five minute model in those lower yeah. yeah. So that's, those are, those are things that right. I think you could use to have yeah. informed conversations that don't get too complicated and yeah. confusing for anybody. Um, and so we'll, we'll try to continue to provide you those resources because we need to provide them for ourselves. Yeah. It cool. gets so complicated. Yeah. 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 Much appreciated. Thank you. Yes, appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Moving on to student and community engagement. Thank you, guys. Uh, so, you know, everything that we do with the SCE department is really an effort in, to support and increase the outcomes that students are able to learn. So, how do we support students, families, uh, in, in an effort in campuses, in an effort to improve learning outcomes for every student as well? So, just a, a brief overview, uh, and I'll get a little bit more specific. We'll talk a little bit about the safety and security standards and wraparound supports that we're focusing on this year. Our leadership development program, which we're really excited about. Our, uh, how are we working to address chronic absenteeism? Uh, our Purple Star designation, which is something we brought to you guys uh, last year. Uh, athletics, uh, working on vertical and horizontal alignment, increasing our earned marketing through our marketing department. And then our restorative and transitional services. So on safety and security, our first goal is we want to exceed all of the TDA mandated safety standards. That's our, that's our initial point is we want to ensure we're not okay with just hitting the mark. We want to see, exceed all of those marks. We're going to continue with our weekly exterior door safety suites, and we had it as a part of our leadership session today, or yesterday, it was really talking about how we own responsibility in doing that, and if you see a need, fill a need, and we're going to make sure that as a group, we're all working together to make sure that we're communicating and fixing our doors as necessary. Uh, providing mental health first uh, aid training for staff, and we're beginning that process this year. Uh, we've really put together uh, really a, a really comprehensive week where we're going to do some bullying awareness campaigns. I'm really excited about us launching that. And we all we know that suicide right now, I should share some statistics, you know, with the, the district leadership team that the, the increases in just even students who are considering suicide uh, just from the last two years is continuing to increase. So, you know, our counselors already do a fantastic job going into cl classes and doing guidance lessons around suicide awareness, but how do we continue to provide prevention strategies and working with our campuses and doing that? Uh, we're challenging all of our campuses to start Safe Promise Clubs, which stands for Students Against Violence Everywhere. Uh, and it's, it's essentially around this design around violence prevention. How do we stop it before it starts? And it's, it's all paid for and endorsed by the Sandy Hook Promise. And if you recall, you know, that was a tragic incident happened at the elementary school. Uh, at Sandy Hook, and so they, they provide everything that schools need in order to get that started. We started this last year in the spring, but we're really trying to create some momentum, is TCHAP. We've partnered with them. It's the Texas Child Health Access through Telemedicine. And so any student that goes to East Central has access to this. It is free of charge. Um, our counselors and administrators have been trained on how do we get kids engaged with this, but this is particularly around uh, drug, alcohol, or bait dependency. And I will be honest, we are seeing nationwide uh, concerns with trends in students with vaping and having access to it. And we're seeing early, earlier and earlier dependency upon that. And so, doing the fact that it's telemedicine, they can do it from anywhere. And uh, many times it'll work with those families and within their schedules, and they offer supports for families as well. And then the last part that we're working with safety and security is how do we bolster our bystander reporting? How do we create a call to action? So how do we provide training not only for our students, but our uh, staff and parents in the community around what our bystander reporting looks like? So we've completely revamped the entire site. It now stands, it says, not in our house. Uh, all of our campuses got posters and individual uh, signs to go in every single classroom with QR codes. And instead of it just being a generic you can ask any kind of question, which is our talk to us right now. It's shifting to if you want to report bullying, you can actually indicate that you're bullying. If you want to report a crime, it goes to report a crime, it goes to crime stoppers and chief, and myself and Mr. C will be notified right away. And then we're going to provide really district-wide training towards that. Um, you know, with our leadership development pipeline, it really exciting. We launched last year our Aspiring Principals Academy. We uh, uh, inducted 15 residents into the program, and this year we're going to be inducting 
28, so we have a total of 43 in the leadership program now. Uh, cohort 1 will be finishing up in the fall that it'll be going through, so you know, to remind you about what the, the goal is, that 70% of their experiences are in jo on the job, so working with their principal mentor and getting some really principal level type of work. 20% of that is in PLC, so we put them in professional learning communities where they, they talk monthly about what are the key learnings that you have around our central concepts and ideas. And then 10% of that time is we bring them all together and we do workshops around those key components of leading the EC way. Um, we're also standing up our new principal induction program, and these are going to be for our first and second year principals. And the idea is how do we build their technical competence, skill, how do we continue to keep them grounded in our leading the EC way uh, indicators and behaviors that we uh, hope for and expect for all East Central leaders. Uh, but then, you know, part of the longer term goal is how do we not only help them to be successful, but how do we retain them? And we know those first two years are going to be so instrumental to be able to do that. And then obviously, of course, our goal is to continue to increase our campus leadership. The, the demographics match what our student demographics are, and we're getting closer and closer to that. Within student services, uh, you know, it's something that is a challenge, uh, not just in East Central, but everywhere, is addressing chronic absenteeism. So even today, we work with maintenance and facilities on how can we create goals on supporting campuses and student attendance. So we're creating a district-wide approach to supporting chronic absenteeism and ensure that students are coming to school. Uh, with campuses, we're working on early tracking and two-way communications. We've learned that the automated phone calls or the harsh tone letters that may come out through our programs aren't as effective as a text. And so working with campuses that already have text uh, platforms, how do teachers have early connections with parents right away by texting them? They're like, hey, today we miss Shane. Uh, we hope he's doing well. And if you need anything, please reach out to us. And that's amazing how these parents will respond. in all the platforms that our campuses have access to actually have translation services. So we'll translate it into their home language. And then the parents can then trans can text back in their language. And it'll translate it back to English so the teacher can read it. And we can try to do that because there's a lot of research and data to show that that helps to support um, we're going to continue to host weekly attendance forms, and these for kids who are starting to show a sign that they are beginning in this school more frequently. And the goal for, for this group is if they started to already have three or more days or parts of days in the last month period, they come to the weekly. And Steve, you can tell you, we started last year, and every single Friday, starting the second semester, we were having an attendance form all day in here from elementary through high school, and then getting our municipal court uh, case managers engaged. Uh, along that way as well. And then we're going to increase the, the number of home visits. We've also done more research to show that if we can go by their home, knock on the doors, ask them what's going on, that also gives us an insight of what's going on in the home. So if we need to provide more of those wraparound supports uh, and services. You know, through our EC Cares uh, and through our social worker that we have and with our connection uh, with various programs, uh, how do we provide wraparound services for families in need? So it's part of the challenge of why a child's not coming to school because they're struggling to pay their light bill, and what can we do to connect them with the services through United Way or through our, our current uh, available uh, resources to be able to help them so therefore that their child can come to school. Uh, next to that, we're going to continue to work on our Purple Star designation. And last year, we brought before you a, a resolution to support military-connected students and families, and as a part of that, um, now what we have done is each campus has identified a military liaison, which is a staff member that will work with families as they are enrolling once they're indicated that they have military connection. How do we help ease that transition coming, because you know, we know a lot of our military connected families are there move around the country all the time and they're continuously having to relocate. So as a part of that Purple Star designation, that's something we've done, as well as what is our onboarding and how do we have military connected family events so a lot of campuses in the spring started doing that. So we won't know until September which campuses were able to reach that. We also have very robust information on our website. So if you want to look it out, look for it and, and uh, do a little research on it. But we're really excited about the, the shifts that we've made in that and being able to support military-connected families. And then last but not least, we know that if we want to help students increase in learning, help improve chronic absenteeism, how do we get parents to be more engaged and more involved? So we've got a lot of plans that we're going to be using moving forward to help support that. I have a quick question. Yes, ma'am. Just back on the left. Uh, you said you had started doing the weekly attendance forums. Is mm -hmm. that already this year, last year? Yes, ma'am. We started that in the spring, and now our goal will be we're going to do it every Friday for the entire school. What kind of response were you getting? Oh, it was, well, actually what we were seeing was once the child and the family and the mom and the dad came in for the meeting, their attendance rates began to improve substantially after that. And once they came in to do that. Now, we just... 
logistically what happens is if they don't show up, they get a warning letter. Then the municipal courts will go do a home visit. If they still don't show up, they get called to a mediation. If they don't show up, then we get to take them to court and where there the judge will maybe say, get your kid to school, but right now that's part of our other challenges. There's not really any substantial support when it comes to legal side that can happen. So we're doing everything we can to try to push that. But there's different layers. But our first step is how do we get them here so we can have conversations around it. How many of them actually come to the forum? Yeah, and, and what result, what, what, was that helping? Were you seeing them oh, get yeah. back, oh, yeah. back no. involved? Definitely we're seeing huge, huge shifts in that. Wow. I'll say we had about 80% attendance. There was still the 20% that didn't come. Right. Uh, and even though we would continue to send notification notices, then the municipal court case manager with uh, Mr. Hernandez would go knock on the door, what do we need to do to get your child here? Then they may start taking it serious and then they sit down. They did not then, then we had to do the mediation. If they didn't show up to mediation, which actually was the judge, then they were summoned to go to court and then they would have to go from there. So, but we did see market improvement from the kids that were there. And that was good. Yeah. Now the goal is how do we continue that throughout the year? So Thank it's a great question. Thank Absolutely. You. That really does work. I, I have 12 perfect attendances when I was back in 1902 when I was <laughs> and, and they're all in a, in a great big box. My dad, I, I, I don't ever recall him missing a day of work. Um, mm -hmm. my, my grandmother who lived with us, I think, had the same kind of My point is, when the family gets behind you and, and you know, uh, my sister had asthma, so, you know, she did as, as well as she could, but I had, even with childhood mm -hmm. immunizations, my teacher, uh, Childhood disease. <laughs> my my teachers worked with with uh, me and, and and in a way that when I was even sick, I was able to attend school uh, in in a way and then get my my homework and all of that. So I'm seriously, I have twelve. And so you know, so that was in my family. So when I you know I had my sons, I expected the very same thing. And so you, I think that is really great when the family can kind of come together and applaud that. Everybody may not be, be an A student, but right. you you can all work together to make sure that that student is in school. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, you got to come to school to learn. Yeah. Right? I mean, yeah, that's kind of the big key. And one of the things is, you know, after we've come through COVID, we've recognized that some to some families, unfortunately, school is still an option. So how do we create conditions they understand the longer term impact for social and emotional development, not just academics, right? Some people just think it's only related to ADA, but we care about your child learning, and we want to help the child grow socially and emotionally, right? We want to help set them up so even as early back as before third grade, if they begin to show chronic absenteeism, you can already correlate that they're going to be less on track for college readiness by the time that they go to graduate. So how do we promote that? So we're using marketing communications, other tools and platforms, we're going to try to educate our families and our community around why school is important. That's why yeah. I have that picture of attendance works because yeah. they have a lot of great resources. And, and again, so, and it sets an yeah. expectation for work and everything yeah. else that you do. You don't miss. You, you just don't miss. You Absolutely. attend. Absolutely. You have a strong work ethic. You yeah. can count it on, right? You're dependable. You're reliable. So it's more than just coming to school for money. It's coming to school because we care about you and want you to learn. You got to learn that life skill. That happens. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so with our restorative transition services, um, continuing to work on individual case management, getting the kids exactly what they need in order to be successful so when they do return back to their campuses. These are kids that have committed, unfortunately, a student code of conduct violation that's requiring for them to be off the campus for some time. Uh, so as a part of that, they get targeted social skills lessons. They're going to be working on restorative community service projects um, as well. And ultimately, the long-term goal is we want to reduce recidivism. If, if they ever have to go there for whatever reason that requires by law, that the you know, Texas Education Code that we have to send in there, our goal is if we do it right and we transition them right and we provide some targeted social skills right, right, if we build in connections by giving, having them give back and also learn through the restorative process of how their behaviors maybe have been impacting others and maybe they make a better decision next time through those social skills, then ultimately when they get back on the campus and maybe something similar right, they make a better decision and a better choice. And then they'll also have support on the campus because as a part of that case management, it carries on with them on the campus. So whether it's their counselor checking in with them often or connecting them with a teacher that's a strong, heavy mentor that's getting them connected with a club or an extracurricular group so we can try to keep them engaged and then help them make better decisions beyond moving there. So really proud of that. Working with athletics, um, of course, we're going to continue that case management. That if you notice, we put attendance at the beginning, so they're going to be focusing really heavy. They put a lot of goals around attendance there, but again, focusing on attendance, behavior, and grades. 
Uh, one of the other focuses they've got this year is really working first and foremost on the horizontal alignment. So from even from pre-athletics in sixth grade all the way through the varsity athletics that they're getting common terminology, common programming, they're learning the common drills. So it doesn't matter if they're at Heritage, doesn't matter if they're at Legacy, doesn't matter if they're on the freshman, doesn't matter if they're on the JV, doesn't matter if they're on the varsity. They're all getting the same. And that also doesn't just mean in the plays and the way that they do that, but it also means the way the program is being organized and run and what the expectations are. And then with the vertical alignment, the goal is, is that if you have a boys and a girls program, let's say boys and girls basketball, they're running their programs also similarly. So it's not something different for the girls program than it is for the boys. Those coaches, those two head coaches are aligned in their philosophy, they're aligned in their approach, and they're aligned on how they handle uh, their programs. So therefore, you're building more continuity and consistency across the board. And then they've done a great job and they can continue from the student level all the way from the middle school all the way up through to include the staff on their leadership development program. So that's been something that will continue on uh, for this next year. With marketing communications, they came out just recently. We're really excited about the family resource guide, uh, which will go to every single family as, that enrolls in East Central, and it provides them just a tool of resources um, that are available for them, for not just the, the calendar and the profiles of an East Central graduate, but what do all the different departments do? Who are your contact points that you may need when those things come up? It provides them a QR code that access your parent portal, so if you haven't set that up, you'll be able to check your child's attendance, behaviors, and grades. Can um, you grab some of those families? I think we actually may have some right there. We can give you all some. Uh, it actually has our anonymous reporting, bystander reporting information that's there. And if you notice, it even has what's called our standard response protocol. So it shares with our parents or families, like, what do we do in the case of a secure? What does a hold mean? If we have to go into lockdown. What does that mean? So it breaks it all down um, as well. And so uh, uh, Mr. Oliver and his team worked incredibly hard this summer to put this together. And of course, that's a document that will continue to evolve and change every year as years come out as we realize we've got new needs and new ways to communicate with our family around it uh, as well. Uh, I've already uh, kind of alluded to it, but I've talked about the bystander reporting tool and education around that and how do we continue to promote that, that kids got to see something, you say something. Don't hold on to it. And what do we do with it next? Um, I'm really excited about this, and that's to increase earned marketing. What it means by earned marketing is that how do we get free marketing? So part of that free marketing is using and utilizing and leveraging our current media's connections to promote the great things that happen within ECISD. And he's at, he has a capability of tracking like how much earned media do you get from that. So I know we had a post that our, we had a, a spot on the news last year that got a lot of views. And I remember him showing me that that was like $78,000 worth of media that we earned if we were to have to pay for it, if we were to send that out. So how are we going to try to continue to increase that? Well, part of that is working with partnering with our local media. His job is he's continuing to send out media reports to invite media to come to some of these great events and things that we have on campus as often as we can. If we've got a student or a program that we want to highlight, how do we get the media in to be able to see it so we get free publicity so that they can see that we're not just about a stupid grade that's been given to us by them, that we're more than that. Um, this past year, we got really good, and we're going to continue to get great, is that refining our crisis communications plans. When the event occurs, how do we communicate with the families and the parents about what's going on? The example would be when we had the dumpster fire in front of Sinclair. Um, you know, Brandon immediately went right to the campus, and the great thing was, was he, every, every about 90 minutes, was sending communication out to the families about, okay, here's our current status, here's where we at, and what was amazing was we got... We got very little complaints or concerns, and parents knew exactly uh, what was going on because he continuously stayed on top of that. So parents want to be different than what we had in the past. They oh, well, they want to know everything. Okay, so I mean, if they want to know everything, and if you don't tell them everything, so we're doing we're we're going to continue to work on building that um, and doing some some work there. And then the last thing with Marcom is the website retooling. Uh, you know, our website looks great, it's robust, but uh, he's updating the platform, so we're excited. Sometime around September, we're going to launch it. I'm just going to leave it at that. It's going to look really amazing. The thing that I like about it, it has intuitive software with, that's going to be embedded in it, that depending on the types of searches that are happening consistently, what pops up to the top where it'll be where the main page is at, that will be what floats up to the top. So you don't have to go buried underneath there. So if families are trying to look for one thing particularly, that will be what actually shows up at the front page when it comes up. So it, it's really it's an amazing uh, opportunity um, there. 
with our police department. Um, I think you can see Mr. Johnson right there in that picture, <laughs> right, right in the corner on that side. And he's just sitting right over there as well, so it looks very, <laughs> looks very familiar. Um, they're going to they're going to continue their daily officer inspections. We really ramped that up this past year. They completed a Google form, and they were checking things from like playgrounds, exterior, perimeter fencing, and the neighborhoods uh, around the area to ensure that there was nothing that was going on, as well as the doors, uh, any other potential vulnerabilities they have in the parking lots, the entry vestibules, visitor management system, the cameras. Uh, they were continuously checking those things, and they're having to report back that they had checked those, what they had checked. So we can stay on top of what are we monitoring and so what gets monitored is, is what gets done and they did a great job this past year of that. Um, we're going to continue, as I mentioned uh, the last time I had a chance to visit with you, uh, increase that frequency of training with our first responder uh, agencies and crisis preparations. And you can see these are two pictures from the event that we were able to hold, the unified uh, command drill, the active shooter drill that we did at Pecan Valley. We, in a few weeks, we're going to be out at Tradition. In fact, uh, Officer Johnson and I were just talking about it. we got a meeting next week with uh, the ESDs and the SAFB and SAPD in Bear County to get that all lined up at Tradition Elementary. We're going to be doing that on a Saturday. So excited about that. And our goal is that we're going to, the next 18 months, we want to have one of these drills on every single campus across the district working with these agencies. Um, continuing to use our mentoring program and connecting it to attendance. So they're going to have a signaling system when students are starting this and they know that they need a, a strong figure to provide some mentoring. Connecting our officers with kids who maybe also struggle with attendance needs uh, as well. And then continue to increase visibility and accessibility. Something we heard from our staff, from our parents, from our students. And when they see the officers, they physically see them on the campus interacting with the kids, interacting with the parents, they feel safer. So it makes, it gives that sense of safety and they feel more comfortable sending their kids to school every single day. So just in a nutshell, uh, continue to make sure that we see all safety and security standards and provide wraparound supports, uh, accentuate our leadership development program and continue to build that up to include our new principal induction, address our chronic absenteeism, I pledge to work on our vertical and horizontal alignment, increasing our urban marketing, and then continue to ramp up our restorative and transition services. So I try to talk as fast as I can because I'll give 15 minutes and I know it's 16 minutes and 17 seconds. So I'll I'll be, like, <laughs> I'll be happy to answer any other questions you may have. Great. So I'm going to start talking back over here since I only have 15 minutes. <laughs> As Mr. McKay said, part of our responsibilities on the Operations and Support Services Department is, of course, to provide as much uh, service as we can to our campuses and our departments so that they don't have a need and can support our instruction in the classroom so that every student is learning and they can be the best they can and they have all the needs that uh, they have everything that they need. So one of the departments that I support is the personnel department. And what I'd like to remind you of or what let, let you know that they're working on for this next year is definitely internal reviews of staffing. We are growing so fast and we have population changes at our campuses. So personnel department is going to make sure that they're staying on top of monitoring that with their administrators and making sure that we know our counts at the campuses every every quarter, if not sooner, and that we're responding to that. We're looking at our staffing ratios, we're looking at our student attendance to determine where we need more staff also. So that's going to be consistently something that we do regularly. Um, in addition to that, with internal staffing reviews, we're going to also make sure that we're preparing this next year. Believe it or not, we've got to be prepared to open a new elementary school the following year. So what does that mean? That means a lot of shifts and changes. We've got to, y'all are going to have a process this year where y'all are going to be naming and decide, making some decisions on the new elementary school. This year, Mr. Kiscano has asked personnel to be prepared that when the decisions are made as to the leadership team there, we start also before the end of this next, this school year, making sure that the staff is prepared to move over to the new elementary school as we open it the following year. So that's gonna be a major shift. And that's this year, this following year, we've got another campus to open. And then the following year, another campus to open. So personnel is gonna be rocking and rolling, making sure that we are hiring, we're hiring appropriate staff, um, that we're keeping up with the numbers, and that's just for new growth. As we do that for new growth, we also have to make sure that um, 
our hiring managers, which are not just our principals. There are directors, there are coordinators of those departments, that they know how to, the best practices on how to hire staff. Are they looking at the resumes appropriately? Are they looking at the applications for any hidden secrets or anything, information we should be looking for in there? Are we checking references? Is your committee that you're deciding that is making the decision for you on who you're hiring, are they trained on how that process should look like? Um, are, as we get recommendations, are we vetting them appropriately? Because the best choice we can make is to hire the right person to start with. And once we can make that decision and have, make sure that we are sound or feel comfortable about it as we can, then we start working on retention. Teachers are hard to find. They have a choice. We want it to be us. So we want to start working with or continue working with our administrators to make sure that those probationary teachers that come in, some of them with very little experience of any in a classroom, even observing alternative certification are great revenue avenues for hiring new teachers. Some of our best teachers came through alternative certification programs, but they have very little exposure to the classroom prior to coming in and being a teacher. So we want to make sure that the campuses and the departments have the resources to support those teachers. What do they need to look for? Are they, are they making sure that they have the mentors and the support for instruction to start with so they can deliver good instruction, but to want to stay? So probationary periods usually last three years for most brand new teachers unless they come to us from another district that then we get them for one year probationary that we are making sure that we're retaining them, that they're choosing us and we're continuing to train them. So retention is a big thing. And I list also PASSA there, because as y'all know, PASSA is a program that works with us to continue to give us our demographics and our changes and shifts as they're happening currently. We have partnered with PASSA now, I think we're going on our third year that we're gonna do it every year for I believe five years to continue to get to at least five years to, to continue to get that information so that we can present to Mr. Toscano where we see the biggest growth, are we preparing appropriately, do we need to consider boundary changes, how, how quickly do we need to respond to be prepared to make sure that each campus has what they need adequately for PASA. So um, one of the things that the personnel department will also be doing because retention is so critical is providing this next year to every campus and department, because retention is not only important in our classrooms, it's important in all of our departments. So they're going to be providing data to each of the departments as to what their retention rate is every quarter. If we lose a teacher, if we lose a, somewhat a custodian, if we lose a maintenance person, they're going to get that information quarterly so they have it at the forefront. What am I doing, what am I not doing to retain that staff member? So they'll be doing that also. Um, Mr. McKay uh, mentioned the Holsworth program and the work that they've been doing. Personnel is a vital part of that with developing a pipeline for identifying staff that is prepared to become the next level, for example, principalships. But along with that, we're also looking for the next director, the next coordinator, the next supervisor. So um, the personnel department is going to be beefing up what we call our hiring manual to help support and help the principals and directors know what to look for in promoting their next person. So that's the leadership pipeline. And also with strategic staffing, I um, wanted to let you know that we have been working diligently in trying to create programs on how to find new educators, new employees. And so one of the residency <coughs> programs that we've started this year is a partnership with UTSA that is going to continue. And we're going to continue to look for other opportunities. Um, and then grow your own, which means we start them as high school students, supporting them financially and uh, academically to hopefully come back and work for us. So that's, per that's personal. Questions? All right, moving on. Maintenance and facilities manager. Um, we were tasked with um, the goal this year of making sure that every department was doing everything that they could to make sure that our, t our students 
are willing to come to school, that they want to come to school, and that we're providing for them. So Mr. McKay mentioned it earlier. We sat and worked with maintenance yesterday and today. What, what's happening in the maintenance department to make sure, well, with every department, to make sure that we're doing everything we can to provide no excuses for kids not to want to come to school. That's to make sure that the, the temperature is comfortable in the classroom, that the HVAC is working, that the, the teacher's room is equipped with everything that they need, that the monitors are working, that the projectors are working. So we've got a big task and we're going to be monitoring that more frequently. One of the ways that we're going to do that is through our customer service school do survey. We've been using school do now for a couple of years, for a while in fact, in maintenance, but we discovered that we're not really using it to its fullest potential. In fact, we've changed some of the ways we're going to be using it. Um, we're tracking right now just how fast we can do a work order, but we're not really tracking um, the satisfaction in how that work was done, which is critical to our customer. Um, so we're going to be really looking at school do and reinventing the process of how we explore and utilize it to make sure that we're monitoring not only how quickly we can get the, their needs addressed, but what the satisfaction is. There's a survey part of school do that we don't even follow, we haven't been following up on or whether they even completed or not. So it's going to be a requirement. Um, Miss Judy is uh, hosting a session next week for our um, campus administrators, I'm going to call them that, campus administrators who respond to school do. And one of our people is going to go over and talk to them about the importance and how of filling out the surveys afterwards and telling us the truth. Did we complete the task? Did we complete it satisfactorily? Um, do we need to go back and address it again? Did we fix it and it stayed fixed? So we're going to be really wanting that feedback and seeking that feedback uh, through customer service. Retention is critical. Again, every time we get a new person in our maintenance department, we spend um, monies and times training them on how to be a better building mechanic. Our foremans this year started monthly trainings to make sure that their skill set is increasing. Not only are they bas doing basic things like replacing lights and uh, many lights, but we're teaching them plumbing, we're teaching them electric electrical, basic electrical work, so that they don't have to call someone else out they can handle the problem. Um, we're spending a lot of time, we want them to stay. So again, when Ms. Sanders meets with them and gives us our retention rate, we lose one person on our building mechanics team, that's 10% of our staff. We only have 12 of them. So we've got to keep them trained, invested, and wanting to stay with us. And of course, we've been fiscally, we're working on continuing to be fiscally responsible with our ESSER monies this year. We've been able to replace more HVAC units than we've done, I think, in the, probably the last 10 years. We've done a lot of roofing uh, projects because of the insurance money that we received back. Um, we were very grateful for ESSER. In fact, we completed projects that we were supposed to wait for next year to do. We were able to get them done this year. So we're proud of that. And of course, as y'all know, the bonds. We, were, we want to thank y'all because we were allowed to hire one more project manager for construction. I believe, if not, not mistaken, at our next board meeting, we'll be giving a brief presentation on the updates on all the construction that's happening on the bond. We've got stuff going on everywhere, so that's going to keep us busy this next year with the bond work. Um, technology. One of the goals for technology, technology this year, again, also will be every department you will see a goal on how we're going to help make sure that um, attendance is improved by our students. We're really working, going to work, make it a goal that as many devices as we can have at the campuses that are there for student use, we should, we're, we're, we're hoping to be able to support a one-on-one -on -one eventually for each student. We've been giving, uh, found grants and monies to be able to provide more resources at the campuses, so that's going to continue to be a goal. Uh, the infrastructure improvement of Wi-Fi connectivity, more, the more devices people bring into our campuses, the better Wi-Fi we need to have, and so that's going to continue to be a focus for us also. Um, we're going to continue and want to um, improve the skill set of our technicians. We hired this last year a trainer um, in our department that's going to be working with curriculum to make sure that this next year 
that our programs as far as training and our badging systems are implemented and carried out for all of our current employees and um, that the teaching in, is not just staying in technology, that we're, we're giving it out to all of our campuses. And our replacement schedules will continue. In transportation, um, what's going to be new this year is that we're going to be routing and, and setting routes for not only uh, shuttling our uh, Leadership Academy, we've added the STEM Academy that transportation will be provided to from the other campuses. If you attend Tradition and you want to go to PV STEM Academy, we're going to have shuttles for that. So it's a little, it's been difficult, but uh, it's a challenge that we're up to. We're really trying to balance those times to make sure we get the kids, the students there on time. We are still struggling with finding enough drivers, but we're doing the best we can. We also, we've had support from the district to mail out flyers. With that, we got three to four bus drivers um, in, in our system. So it's a struggle, but we're gonna continue to pro provide the service to all of our campuses and all of our programs. Recruitment and retention. One of the things that we're gonna be changing this year and working towards is moving from a route pay system to an hourly pay system. That was information that has been provided to us from several years, really, I, I would say, from our CASBE uh, uh, salary reviews. They've asked us, they've told us, you really should have done this a while back. It's overdue. And we've worked very hard with Miss Judy to make sure that our drivers are being paid a comparable rate. In fact, when we changed to hourly rate and we compared what we were going to be going to for our hourly, hourly rate, we're above m several of the districts around us. In fact, most of the districts around us were, were above. We've already started that transition and had communications with our current drivers. We're grandfathering. So uh, those that started with us, that have been with us last year, will be slowly transitioning. Any new employees, though, will be starting on the hourly pay rate. So far, we've got very little very little um, concerns or questions coming to us, but we have our all-employee meeting on August 9th to anticipate they'll come with questions. And of course, like any other employee, when you tell them something's changing in the way they get paid, the first question they're gonna have is, how does that affect me? So we're making sure we're getting all the data together so that we have comparable uh, information to be able to share them. You were on the route pay, you made this. Now you're gonna be on hourly, you're gonna be doing this, and it's gonna transition slowly. And uh, we, we're working with the payroll department and the benefits department and the finance department to make sure that if it's a benefit for them to move sooner than the following school year, there's the probability that we will start that shift for them in January instead of waiting <coughs> if it's a benefit to them. If it's, if it's gonna make, make a slight change or if they're not ready for the change, we're gonna, we're gonna continue to support them and have that communication and make sure they, they understand what's going on so that the following school year, when we're all on hourly, which is a system we probably, like I said, we should have been using it for a while, that they're ready to transition. So that's gonna be a step that we're working on this next year also. And as y'all know in the bond, um, one of the new facilities that we're gonna be acquiring is a new transportation depot. Plans are coming along. Uh, we've got some sketches ready. We're waiting for planning on the new property. We've had a little bit of a shift and change on that but that is also something we're gonna be working on this next year for a new facility. In custodial, again, recruitment and retention. We have the most custodians we've had in a number of years, but are we fully staffed? Not quite yet. Uh, our turnover rate is not, sat is, we're not happy with our turnover rate in the custodial department. When we looked at, when Mr. Tuscar asked us to look at our retention rate, and we found out custodial was one of the departments that Hyatt had the lowest retention rate, we recognized we've got to do more. We're paying them a great salary, a great starting salary. In fact, this past year we hired several custodians that came to us from other school districts because we were paying higher. We are really taking an effort to make sure that they know not only is the pay rate better here, but their benefits are better here. You know, they don't have to take our health insurance, but yet they can get medical services through our telemed, teledoc. So, um, of our own employees, we want to make sure we're recruiting, we're retaining, and that their daily attendance, our employees' daily attendance, is as critical as our students. Because if they're not here, then somebody's got to work overtime and exhaust themselves to get the job done. So, we're working on that. 
We've also worked this past year and will continue to work to standardize the equipment that the uh, custodians have so that when you go to, from campus to campus, they all have the same type of equipment with the number that they need for the size of their campus. Um, and also training the EC way. We found that to, in order to increase retention, that if we train the custodians before we gave them an assignment on the task, that they're staying longer and there's more job, job satisfaction. We know that from surveys that we've committed, so we're going to continue that practice for this next year. So to recap, um, in the operations and support services department, retention is going to be critical in every department. Supporting campuses with student attendance is going to be critical in every department. Nurturing and creating new partnerships. I didn't mention that, but every one of our uh, departments has critical partnerships within district. So we're going to continue to nurture those and to be fiscally responsible. I think I didn't tell you, but I think you closed. <laughs> Thank you. Uh -huh. Any questions? Uh, not least. Business and finance. Okay. This will be in combination and roll into the board of workshops. So Judy, you can roll right into that when okay. we get to that point. And that uh, budget workshop is the uh, impact right. of these Well, we'll start off first with uh, fund balance. Which I'm very proud of our fund balance. And it's a, a tribute to the uh, leadership of the district, to the board, and to all of our directors and our principals. Uh, we at 21-22 had a, a fund balance of $34 million, uh, which was significant from where we have ever been. And uh, that is really going to help us in the next few years. And so, uh, like I said, having that fund balance is, going to, is critical because it's also, uh, we're earning interest that I have never seen that we've earned before on interest. Yes, at one time we had 13% interest. Y'all are far, <laughs> but uh, we are getting five, five and a half percent interest, and that's really helping, and also it's helping the construction fund of what we're getting interest each month. Uh, East Central is still the lowest tax rate in Bear County, uh, and I think that we will continue that for 23-24, uh, mainly because of our appraised values that have gone up. So. Uh, you know, we know that if you have a house here in East Central, you'll be paying a lot less tax than if you live in SAISD or Harlandale or one of those other school districts. So that is good for the taxpayers of East Central, and it's good for East Central. Our debt ratio, now this is 2022, is we have the lowest debt ratio for uh, a school district in uh, Bear County. Is that going to happen, continue in 23 or 24? Maybe not because we've sold some bonds. It depends if the other school districts are selling bonds, uh, where we'll be with them. But we will not have a debt ratio like Harlandale. They, they've maxed out. They, they are trying to be able to do anything. But East Central, uh, I think we'll still be in a good spot. We might not be the lowest, but we'll be in the ballpark. Do y'all have any questions on any of the slides I went through? Okay, do you know why we were able to improve our, our fund balance? It's Esther 2 and Esther 3. Because we made a conservative effort of being very careful of how we spent that money. Uh, Esther 3 had been paying for the majority of the high school salaries. Why did we choose high school salaries? Why didn't we choose elementary or whatever, comparability. We don't have to be comparable with anybody at high school. If we try to use it at the elementary schools, then you have that comparability report that you have to fill out when you have to compare one, uh, one school to another. So uh, it was decided that ESSER 3, we would pay uh, the teacher salaries at the high school. If there are 100% uh, regular teachers, uh, we didn't pay for any athletic periods. We didn't pay for any career or tech or any special ed. But that's, that is about $3.6 million a year that we've been able to use that. Also, SR3 has done a lot of the building programs that Stevie had talked about. And also, uh, there's 20% of that that we have to uh, do on for learning loss. And Dr. Fuller has been good about doing different programs to help on that. Now, ESSER 3, we have one more year. 
So we're going to continue paying those teachers' salaries. And we will have spent all of SR3 by the end of August. And I will say we will have spent all of that money because we will make sure that we're not sending one dime back. SR2, it ends at the end of next month. What we use that for was to pay some of the middle school salaries. But what we did, we were fair to legacy, we were fair to heritage, we didn't want to worry about comparability. So we were able to do that and we continue to pay some this year and do some other programs. We also did a lot of custodial supplies, uh, more maintenance supplies. We did some uh, social uh, emotional learning. And so uh, we, we will have spent all of it by next month. And the reason why they go till the end of September, but we're gonna spend it by 831 because we don't wanna have it for another year on the books. So we want to have a clean audit, and we've spent all that money. We don't have to have carryover. You know, have any questions? Uh, can you help me with ESSER? Okay. What is ESSER? I'm sorry. Okay. Elementary, secondary, so forth, so forth. Oh, the secondary. Secondary. That's what changed. Elementary, secondary, secondary. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Okay. That's what I'm saying. That came in from the COVID money. Gotcha. Okay, our compensation 23 and 24. And have you ever seen something and you get an immediate headache because you see something wrong? <laughs> well, I got the immediate headache while I go because <laughs> this should have been 23, 24, and this should have been 57,500. Uh, so uh, for some reason, I didn't have that down correctly, but 5, 10, 15, and 20 years uh, are all correct. And so we are going to start our teachers this year, which all approved last, the, the last month in May at uh, 57500 And we're, you know, y'all are really great about being committed to being very competitive with the other school districts. And it is very competitive. And I will tell you that uh, a lot of the school districts, you know, that our friends with other directors, uh, they'll tell me, oh, gee, we're not going to do that. Oh, we can't pay that much, Judy. You pay it 57 dollars How are you doing that? And then I see in the newspaper, they're going to go to 60000 You know, so it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world out there, and we have to be competitive. And, you know, our bus drivers and monitors, they're receiving the same kind of pay increase percentile like everybody else. Uh, we're doing a 3% of midpoint pay increase, and a lot of that, uh, was based on the salary study that Kathy did, which uh, I know Roman had talked about when they had, you know, passed the salaries booklet. Is they really said that East Central was very competitive. There was only a couple of areas that we weren't, and we fixed them. But they said, really, you know, our instructional paraprofessionals. They said we were above market. Our support paras, we were above market. Uh, you know, our different building mechanics, we were above market. We were very above market for our ECPD. So I feel good that we've kind of stayed in line with what we, not only we want to be competitive, the main thing we want, we want to give our employees a living wage. So we're being able to do that. Y'all have any questions on that? Employee health care. I, I think this is one of the things that I am most proud of because I am proud of a couple of things. I'm proud of Roman Piscara and I'm proud of Shannon Burke. They have worked on this to where we are giving a really good benefit to our employees. And I'm going to tell you why I'm proud of them. It didn't matter previously if we thought we should do better for our employees for benefits. It didn't happen. When Roland came on board, both Shannon and I talked to him, Roland, we need to do something. We need to do this, do that. His immediate response was, go find out, see what we can do. Our benefits department used to get slammed on the surveys, saying how horrible our benefits were, how terrible health insurance, how the life insurance and whatever. Now we get kudos. All of those ladies, they're just raving about our, our wellness program, our medical coverage. They're, they're you know, so happy to have Dr. Hill and that it doesn't cost to go there. So uh, 
I, I sing their praises because without their leadership and their insight to this, we would still be behind the curve on our, on our benefits program. And I will give you one big example. We had, this is the reason why I'm so proud, is we have uh, life insurance for our employees. And at one time it was, okay, if you had health insurance, you get 10,000. If you don't have health insurance, you get 20,000. Well, we all know that a funeral costs about $10,000 or more. And, you know, I said, that doesn't help our employees, especially our auxiliary employees. If something happens to them, their families are going to have a hard time. So Shannon and I did a little research, and we realized that for very little money, we could double their policy so that they could have a little peace of mind to bury their family member, then have money to see what they need to do. It, it, did, it hardly cost the district anything. But what it gave peace of mind for people, and we've had to use it on several occasions. Uh, so again, uh, I'm just very proud of what we've done. That's awesome. That's very nice. Purchasing. Uh, purchasing department has improved tremendously. Uh, Ms. Rokas is in charge of purchasing, and uh, if she knows she has to do it, you better get out of her way because she's going to get it done. And we told her, hey, we have to have our quick facets and our inventory control items done. So she's worked very hard to make that happen. She's improving it all the time. And so I feel good that we're getting to a place where we should be. Uh, also, the, we had to have commodity codes. That's another regulation we have to start having on our POs. And then what we've also done is what we call lunch and learn this year. And that, we've done four of them. And we provide the secretaries, clerks, anybody who wants to come, and we do it during lunchtime so they can eat. We only keep them for an hour, and they learn something. And those have been very beneficial to our secretaries and our clerks. So we're going to do that again next year, but we are going to expand it next week and have a longer lunch and learn and learn and learn because it's going to last several hours. <laughs> <long. laughs> so, uh, and then we're also purging a lot of stuff that just needs to go away. And the next thing that we have given the task to Meredith to do is we want to go digital. We want to get all of our old records in a digital format. You know, we've been talking about that forever. I, I am the world's worst pack rat. You want to see something happen in 1980, just go ask Judy, she's got it somewhere. I, I, don't, I don't want to have all that paper anymore. So uh, Meredith is getting quotes together, and we'll be working on that for next year. So that way we'll have the space where we need to have it, and we won't be all over the place. Any questions? Child nutrition. You know, when COVID was happening, oh, we thought for a little bit we were going to have to fund them for out of general operating because they went down very low on their fund balance. Well, I'm very proud to say that uh, their fund balance is so high now. Uh, we had to uh, take an amendment to y'all that they had to spend three months of that excess money in order to stay in compliance. They also had an audit done by TA and uh, also the federal government that came at the same time. And out of the thousand questions they asked, they only had two things wrong. And one of them was they didn't have milk at Salado. They didn't have enough options. They didn't have enough options. That they had ran out of one option of milk. So uh, out of a thousand questions, two wrong is pretty good. Mm -hmm. So just to recap, we will continue with a healthy fund balance uh, at the end of this year. I'm not going to really say what it will be because I'm still putting the numbers to that. We will still continue the low, lower uh, total tax rate, our debt ratio. That might fluctuate a little bit. ESSER funding, we're going to spend everything we can. Uh, we're being very competitive with our compensation. Our employees' health care is wonderful. Oh, and we're getting a nurse practitioner. Oh, wow. So that's even going to be better. Uh, 
people can get in there quicker and then try to do a little bit longer hours to help our employees. Uh, then we're increasing uh, what we're going to spend on our employees' health care. We're going to go up by $15 a month, which is going to cost us about uh, $198,000. Purchasing, we're going to continue to do everything we have to do with that. And then our child nutrition program, uh, they have a great team, and they're just going to continue to improve and to offer good meals to our students. Do y'all have any questions? The uh, nurse practitioner will join Dr. Hill. Uh, the nurse practitioner will join Dr. Hill. Yes. Yep, so we're going to be able to expand hours. We had some feedback um, from staff that they wanted earlier hours, and they wanted later hours as well. So with the nurse practitioner and Dr. Hill, we can offer what we were offering plus an hour earlier and an hour later every day so that there's more accessibility wow. to prevent them from having to miss any work. Nice. Nice. I'll stop until y'all Yeah, we're going to take a short break for five minutes. We'll come back at 725. All right. Just to... Are y'all ready? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And now, if y'all need for me to slow down or, you know, Oh, please don't. Uh, <laughs> Fine. Okay. You know, we, every year we do a budget yeah, workshop. And this year it's, it's a couple of weeks earlier than what we've done in the past. Uh, and with it being a couple of weeks earlier than what we have in the past, there's some critical information that I don't really have. Uh, TA is not going to tell us what our tax rate will be until the 1st of August. Uh, <coughs> CR, they have to do a maximum compression rate. And then also we haven't got the certified values from their appraisal company. So we're still kind of uh, waiting on that, but I'm doing the best projections that I can. So the general operating, and that's all we're really going to talk about today, uh, the general operating. Uh, it's consisting of estimated revenues and expenditures for the proposed general operating budget for 23-24. And that our fiscal year is September 1 to August 31st. I do not know how the school districts that do it from July 1 to the end of June when they don't have a lot of this critical information. And especially when it's a year that the legislature's in. Uh, y'all know that y'all would be approving the board, uh, the budget by really four areas this time. I didn't put the fourth up there. You're going to be approving the general fund the food service fund, or child nutrition, debt service, which is our interest in taking account. And the new one that y'all will be doing is the construction. So when I bring that, board, uh, that budget to y'all in August, uh, you'll see four areas that y'all will be approving by that different fund. And the state determines the school's needs. And they say, well, are local dollars enough to fill the bucket? If they say no, then on top of that bucket is your taxes. Uh, if they say no state dollars needed, then what happens, all of that is from your taxes. The state's not going to give you any money. So the state dollars are on top. Below, as you can tell, there's your taxes again. It's going up and up. And it's a balancing act, uh, state share versus local share. Every time we get a higher appraised value, our local share increases and our state share decreases. Right now, just estimate, it looks like it's going to be $2 million or more that our, our share is going to go up next year. But again, that will all depend on what the state comes up with as our MCR and what we get our appraised value at. So they never let you really get ahead. If you're going to get ahead, it's going to have to be from your opinion. Yeah, just so, so just to restate, I'll know this, you know, everybody knows their property tax bills have gone through the roof, and the assumption is, man, I'm looking at that bill, it's, it's school taxes, and that keeps going, up. Yeah, I've got all the money in the world. What do you, for one, why are you asking for a bond? Mm -hmm. uh, you got more than you need. The reality of it is it's still the same money. The bucket doesn't flow. Mm -hmm. It just means that the state share got backed out that percentage of what our property tax revenue increased. So just for conversation tonight, yeah, continue no, to add I, 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 I know you've all had them. Mm -hmm. but. Uh, 
what I did is I showed you the 19, 19, 2019 and 20, our total tax rate was $1.21. Uh, it looks like our tax rate could go down to $1 and one penny all the way up to 0 0.017. Uh, that's because uh, they're going to do the NCR, the maximum compressed tax rate for 2023. You know, we hear some rumbling from the states. Uh, I really don't, I wait until they finally say that's what's going to happen uh, because now they're talking about uh, an election in November for, a, you know, to increase the homestead to 100000 uh, and, and we all know that that will pass. But you know what it's going to do? It's going to impact us. The reason why, not so much when we get the, the homestead exemption, it will impact us is that they're not going to mail out the tax bills now until the end of November or first of December. From October to November, we get over $7 million in current taxes alone. We're not going to get that because they won't be sending out the tax bills. So we'll start getting our money in December. So that's another reason it's nice to have the fund balance because it's going to sustain us for those two months while we wait for those tax bills to go out and we wait for the election. And there might be other things in that, what they skew for us to vote on. Uh, there might be different rules about when you sell bonds and when you don't, if that'll be covered. At first they were talking about our bonds that we sell, we sold this past November, and we wouldn't be held harmless on that, which means they're not gonna make up any money for that. We'll have to raise our tax rate. But now, a Victor called yesterday and he, uh, says that from what he understands is that they will make it hold harmless. So I'm hoping that that's what will happen. But we'll give y'all much more information on that as we go. So the proposed tax rate, again, this is only an estimate, is that our maintenance and operation will be 0 0.8010. Interest and sinking will be the same rate because we told our taxpayers we weren't going to increase any tax. And we're still going to try to do it at seasons. And we're going to be talking to Victor on if we can continue it at seasons. So the total tax rate, like I said, would probably be $1.017. Uh, it's a decrease in the MNO tax rate, and that's because of the maximum com compressed tax rate. INS tax rate will remain the same in order to do a bond at seasons. And we will really see if that's uh, what we should continue to do. It really depends on what the legislature says and that, you know, it's reviewed and it's, we uh, really rely on Victor on uh, his expertise on that. And we're still going to be one of the lowest school tax rates in Bear County. Now, the property tax appraised values, they're determined by Bear County Appraisal District. Um, I received the preliminary on July 7th. We don't get the final one until the very end of July, around the 26th, 27th. But right now, our taxable value increase has went up by 23% from last year. So that will even lower our m and rate again. So that's just to kind of give you an idea that, hey, our values are increasing. There's a lot of rules that will happen with that kind of increase. Uh, but we will know more as when we get the final numbers. Do y'all have any questions about the price value or anything? Uh, just some things to know about the state and local funding structure. The legislative state funding formula has not changed. ADA is $6,160. It has not changed any of the weights on a, a program. Uh, the last time they changed that was in 1920 for the uh, eight, you know, for the ADA, the basic allotment. Uh, unknowns, the special session on the impact on funding, you know, he might call another one about teacher salaries. He might call another one on something else, so we really don't know. And they have not adjusted the basic allotment for inflation. And everything's influenced by enrollment, average daily attendance, special pot, and property wealth. So there's a lot of unknowns, you know, and we we'll should 
no more by the end of the month or the first part of August. Uh, our budget assumption is no increase in the basic allotment. It's going to stay at 6160 uh, maximum compressed rate, which I have talked about already. Estimated property value, 23%. Enrollment projections, 10,975. How's that project, excuse me real quick, yes. how's that enrollment projection compared to our demographic study? Uh, it is it is reflective of a very modest projection of an increase of about 400 kids this year. So is it on track with what the demographic yeah. people are saying? Absolutely. Um, and that is a modest projection. There, they're saying we're pretty much guaranteeing you that, but it's likely to be more, but they don't want to overpromise and under deliver their confidence to be 10 9. But it's on track of what they oh, said. Oh, absolutely. Okay. And, you know, I've said this before, but um, in the United States, there's only five uh, states that still fund their school districts based on average daily attendance. Uh, all the other ones uh, fund their school districts on enrollment. Uh, which I would hope one day maybe Texas would do. Uh, our average daily attendance that we're going to be using uh, is 10097 for the summary of finance to calculate what we think our uh, ADA would be and that we, what we get for state funding. Uh, that's a 92% uh, average daily attendance, and uh, I get nervous about that because I'm conservative. And... 22, 23, we're at 91.3. So I'm hoping that we can make 92. If we can make 93, that would be wonderful. And 94 would be great. So our goal is 94, and every percent increase in ADA is about $800,000 in additional revenue. Mm -hmm. and, and it would even be a little bit more than 800,000 if I started putting all the different uh, special pops rates on there. But that's kind of hard to do with that. So basic, the 800,000 is a whole lot of the average daily attendance. We did an overall increase of 3.7 in compensation and salary adjustments. That's what's going to be in this budget for 23-24. And we're going to increase, like I said, the district health insurance by 15 per month per employee. And then we have to increase for non-payroll inflation. Uh, and we have to go up on utilities. We have to go up on uh, custodial. Also, uh, we've been lucky that a lot of our custodial supplies have been purchased by ESSA. So we'll have to start paying for that ourselves out of local funds. There's other things that inflation has hit that we're looking at and uh, building the budgets. Uh, the majority of the budgets from the different directors uh, and the principals are in the system, uh, but we're still refining them and to see uh, what is a need versus a want. You all have any questions on that? I don't. Okay, right now, uh, this is just preliminary, and this is just rough, that our projected total revenue, and this is just for local maintenance, for general operators, will be 106 million 60,188. Our projected total expenditures would be 107681 As you can tell, we could have a possible deficit budget of $1.6 million, which is the reason why I said the fund balance that we've been able to increase is going to help us for this next year. Now, one thing <coughs> we won't have in the budget that y'all will adopt in August is some of the cost to open the new school because uh, some of the costs <coughs> up in the new school will be paid for by the bond. But there's a lot of other costs that the district will need to pay from the general operators. Uh, in January, we're going to be meeting with all the different directors and saying, okay, what do you need to open that school? Not what you need for the next school year, but what do you need for that this year? And they'll all bring a budget, and then I'll have to take it to the board for an amendment. Okay, we know that our average teacher salary was at $57,500. That was an annual increase of $1,850. 
And, you know, y'all have proved all this already, but I'll be happy to go over each line with y'all. Uh, they receive an average of a 3% increase in salary on a teacher's salary schedule. Our paraprofessional and auxiliary receive a 3% increase paid uh, based on the midpoint. And again, no one is making less than 15 an hour. Uh, exempt auxiliary staff receive a 3% increase based on the midpoint for their pay grade. Bus drivers and monitors, even on the old route pay, they're going to get 3%. All new drivers and monitors hired for 23 24 will be paid by the hour, not by the route. Five hours guaranteed. This has been something that Kathy has, has you know, CB has said. It just happened in the last couple of salary studies. This was from Kathy in 2000. You know, we are one, we are probably one of very few districts especially our size, that still pay by the drop. It's not financially feasible to do that. We need to be financially sound. We need to pay a good salary. We need to make sure we have bus drivers. But we need to do it in a way that's best for the district and best for the employees. Uh, administrative staff receive a 3% of midpoint. And we're going to continue with the $1,000 attendance incentive for teachers, librarians, and nurses for each semester. And we're going to do 500 for instructional paraprofessionals. That's not every employee is going to get that. And the attendance incentive, the main goal of that is because of the cost of subs and that sometimes you don't have a fill rate. So you need to have your teachers there. And so we, we did okay this year. But we're going to really push it for next year uh, that they that we have more teachers and staff get the thousand dollars attendance. And then one thing that we were low on, which Kathy brought out right away, is that we were had to increase the stipends for bilingual life skills redirection. We were very low for band, choir, and athletics. So we upped our salary uh, stipend uh, to be more in line with what they said the market. With me, and uh, it was very much appreciated uh, by the fine arts and by athletics. And there's another fund balance going back to 2009-10, so you can see how we have gradually increased to 34 million dollars, which is going to really help the central next year. And in conclusion, all figures in this presentation are estimates and not the final 23-24 budget amounts. And we're working on finalizing revenue and expenditure estimates. And one thing that what we do is we work with Moat Casey. Uh, we never used to use them, but last year uh, we did. And I was very pleased to use them because, you know, I was always doing this by myself. And I always felt like, what if you got something wrong to you? You know, you, you second guess yourself. Well, we had Mo Cassie do it last year, and I did it at the same time. Well, we were we were spot on, both of us. But the peace of mind I had that a company that does this for everybody, I was like, where have they been all these years? <laughs> you know, so uh, they, they're really great to work with, and so uh, we're going to get more information from them. So do you all have any questions? No. Good information. Thank you for... And y'all will adopt this at the August 24th meeting. Right. Yes, I'm bringing a refined and final budget <coughs> uh, when we have uh, the real numbers. The real numbers in the uh, hopefully it's not a deficit budget, but we know we're, we're, we've added a salary increase, compensation package increase, we don't need money. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, we're still going to be working through mm -hmm. the budgets and tightening things up, as Judy said, really paying attention to the needs first once and trying to bring the board a balanced budget. But, Push comes to shove, but you know what we'll happens if I'm not if we need to, and that's going to be our recommendation. Hopefully not. But Hopefully not. Yeah. Hopefully yeah. not. And again, this is this is with the legislators doing really nothing that they think about. Are you thinking that I know you're almost conservative? I know you asked if we had questions, but quickly, I'm sure you're conservative with the attendance. So should it be 94 uh, percent? Then that would also oh, that would definitely that would take us out of it. Oh yeah. Yes, oh, that yeah. would have yeah. on paper. Well, so as, as uh, Stevie and, and Shane alluded to, we are doing something we've never done before in that the attendance goal is being attacked by yeah. every single department, yeah. office.
all hands on deck. Everybody's going to look deeply at how they can impact attendance, and it's no longer just a thing that schools do. Right. And students yeah, service. Yeah, really everybody yeah. Does. Yeah. Everybody's yeah. talking about attendance. Everybody's got it at the, at the forefront. Mm -hmm. Everybody's doing their part. Everybody's monitoring the progress right. in real time. So yeah, I don't know that there's another way possible to move the needle. We've tried everything, but we need to try everything and something we've never done. Yeah. But it's very helpful, though, with that kind of support. And we will, if we have to adopt a, a negative fund balance, uh, we're not going to be the only district in the state that's doing that. Uh, I've talked to some friends uh, up north, and they're going into fund balance for $25 million. And uh, I'm like, well, we can't do that. <laughs> uh, uh, it, it, it's it's going to be statewide. It's, it's, it's impacting a lot of school districts. Well, because we're starting out with no money. <laughs> <laughs> so not, not on us. That was good stuff. Thank you, Judy. You're welcome. Thank you all. Thank you. Master Clark had a couple of things for trustees in your in the packet. You had a couple of items I want to just uh, point out. You've got your yearly grants. Yes. This is the draft, okay. and we'll finalize it and bring it to you at the regular meeting uh, in, this month. But we added a few things based on the feedback I've been hearing from the board and in collaborating with, with Mr. Massingale. We want to have this goal setting budget work workshop staying in July. We're just always combining them and always doing it in July. We had traditionally done a goal setting workshop, then we would come back, you know, in a few weeks to do a budget workshop. Uh, and we just felt like combining the two maybe was a little better use of time. Um, and then we want to, in August, follow that up with a team building workshop, where that will be the standing workshop every month where you review the board operating procedures and re-adopt annually. So this year we'll be bringing back in August the workshop the current best thinking uh, that the group has. So it's uh, going to have a table of contents, it's, a, it's a quite uh, a more detailed document, more comprehensive, it's a little lengthier, but I think it really hits. Been working with the attorneys since you your last workshop. I think we've got a pretty good draft together that is reflective of all the discussions you guys have had. Should you guys adopt it in August is hopefully the intention, then we'll operate from it. And every August we bring it back and revisit it and reconsider, amend, reconsider, adopt. Yeah. And then in September, we want to start based on your request, uh, that September will be the month where the board does its self-assessment every year. So this September we'll do a self-assessment. Self um, I've got Region 20 coming in this year to facilitate that discussion. Um, there's multiple options for what that self-assessment could look like. We'll start with this process, and every year with your direction, we'll you know, revise and, and, and improve it. But that month will always be the month the board does its self-assessment to determine the priorities for, for learning for the board. Do we have anybody for the team building session? Um, for the team building, um, I, we have, I mean, if we want to, don't know if we want to bring Walsh back again and continue that discussion to finalize, um, or if we want to do some other team building during that, that time. So our team buildings thus far have been like hour sessions. So just, mm -hmm. you only need three hours a year, we far exceed that. Um, but, uh, oh, Jenny, hey. that's a fantastic question. Because yeah. we do have I a guess. team building. We do. We do. We are actually, that's actually, thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, we have uh, Edvar from Region 20 coming in, and we're going to do, uh, we're going to have him facilitate an exercise using a Myers Briggs type personality survey. Um, it's actually a different tool that we've never used before. We'll all take a little pre assessment, we'll get a report on, uh, you know, of what it comes off personally, and then he'll do an exercise with us where we kind of determine how we can use this individually uh, and collectively to be a stronger team going forward and then do the uh, uh, operating procedures. So thank you for letting me talk through and come through that and remember that I booked it. Okay. <laughs> and we'll be glad that you remember. Yeah, and we'll be really glad. Um, so uh, that's, we'll bring this back finalized um, next month and you can put it on your refrigerator. Um, the second thing we have is evaluation packet. Um, very familiar with it. It's pretty self-explanatory. There's a cover page that details out what's in each of the tabs. Um, there's a couple of extra items in here that um, I always include, and one is the data report 
where the data team has really taken all of the information we have and distilled it down into something that makes sense and what's the bottom line? We're making progress or not, and where are we and where are we and how much? Uh, and then there's some summary notes there of for this particular subject across the district, here's what here's the things that we know and what we gotta uh, make progress on. And then uh, in the last tab, you have all the department reports for the year, so they're just there for your reference as you review the information in here. If you want to refer back to it to get more details about some of the things that um, each individual department was working on that I may have commented on, and it's there for you. And then the last page is the summary. So there's a couple of different tabs in there where you'll review some information and do a, a draft assessment. Yeah, I think this is kind of how, we, how we, leadership is performed. And then you aggregate all that in the end in a, in a final um, summary, and it's uh, exceeds proficient and needs improvement with some comments. And this will be what you bring back um, at the regular meeting. You guys have an executive session where you'll all individually discuss um, your evaluation comments and feedback. Um, and and that's share. next week. That's next week, yes, sir. And then you'll share that with me. We bring this back when? This, well, the whole packet. Um, but this is the part where you're the yellow thing. Next when? Next week. Oh, it's a regular, okay. Yeah. Okay, gotcha. This is your kind of summary notes. Okay, gotcha. You, that you can okay. talk from. Okay. Any questions I can answer? So this meeting specifically was board goal setting. Is that Today? goal setting for the district? Because we, when you look up our district goals, there's nothing there, and then it tells you you can download the PDF, but there's nothing there either. It says an error. But on other districts, they have simple, maybe three to five goals for the district. I'm just thinking. Is the website not that? The well, it's just it's done this for a long time. I've looked at occasionally at, on the, specifically Board of Trustees district goals and performance objectives. Okay. It says no previews available, and then it says if you're having trouble viewing the document, the document you can download the document, but it takes you to an error page. The board is not um, posted yet because we posted after this meeting. Well, what are but what are our goals? So you know typically, it's the goal that that Mr. Toscano has on that, on the, um, the, the one that has the cascade at the right. top, okay. that is the one goal that you guys have always had every year. Mm -hmm. If you want to change it, let me know. But once you approve that, then we put that on the web, on the, our um, website. That graphic? Or um, are they going to be listed oh, It's just that one goal. Okay. Uh, do you know what I'm talking about? It's on this yeah, page. Yeah, you, you might be referring to more detail. The annual results well, measure. I mean, just the, these are samples from Kathy, and they're very simple. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Goals, but I'm thinking just because everybody, I don't want to do what everybody else is doing, but if it's if it's working for them and when their people look up their website and they see, okay, well, their district, their goal is um, exceptional campus leadership, high quality teachers, you know what I'm saying? Like, I, and this is through TASI. Yeah. The other yeah. districts have uh, more detail, like the board operating procedures, but I'm just thinking um, the district goals, what are our district goals? And then in turn, next week when we do the evaluation, should we have more specific goals for you specifically? That way you're not like out there trying to fix everything. I mean, yeah. I know you are a fixer of everything, but yeah. you're not trying to like, here I go, I'm gonna, I got all this like specifically for you, what we're looking for as far as progress yeah. or. So. Um, do we set those goals? <coughs> yeah, yeah. So, so um, what we'll bring um, um, next month is the district. The board goal and the district uh, improve uh, the, basically the district goals and campus mm -hmm. and department goals that are cascaded from that, and they'll be reflective of what are the annual results measures, basically the big goals for each of the four priorities. Mm -hmm. So the four priorities are teaching and learning, um, uh, our workforce, strategic partnerships, and operations. So those are the four <coughs> priorities that the East Central ISD has always. Kind of adhere to, but the annual results measures change every year based on right. what CG says. Yeah. And then, so at the district level, there will be a one page document <coughs> that we'll bring to you that will show for each priority what are the annual results measures within each one, mm -hmm. very specific, measurable, time bound. Um, and then you'll, and then furthermore, on the CG side, you'll be able to see, okay, so you know, I went to Northeast, there's their goals, great. Right. That's awesome. Right. But what are you doing about that? Yes. Now you'll be, you'll be able on the CG side to, to see the actual strategic activities. Mm -hmm. And furthermore, at the end of the first quarter, for every one of those activities, did we do it? 
Is it having the intended effect? If not, what adjustments are we making? So what, <coughs> what you won't see from other districts is signaling in real time, are we actually doing it? Right. It's going to look really pretty and be on the shelf if we used to do that. Mm -hmm. Well, we got it approved, but, but it doesn't reflect what we're actually doing and the adjustments we're making in real time. So um, we probably need to make sure that it's very accessible to the well, public. And you, you spoke about before, like a couple of clicks, and they need to get the information that they're looking for, and it's something very basic. I mean, look at this beautiful sheet that I just got handed. I love this. The dress code. Look at how nice. simple and, and easy you to read them. A lot of the district, a lot of the districts are doing. Um, they're adding in their um, district goals like safety and security, and I know we're like ramping up. Anything that they are questioning throughout the year, I think we should have on our website and in a, in not policy, but our our goals specifically touching on safe and secure facilities and um, uh, drug free campuses and things that. Yeah. Parents are most specifically, yep. I mean, all of these are great. I mean, teaching and learning, of course. So 100%, and, and this is exactly, so what Shane was talking about revamping the totally website, yeah. the reason for that is because there's so much information mm -hmm. on our websites, but like right now, the most common thing that people are interested about is registration information, right. but right now, you've got to find it nested on the website, mm -hmm. but with the new re re reformed website, it's intuitive. So if in, in uh, July and August, parents keep going to that page. When you go to the district's website, it's on the front page. Mm -hmm. So if there's a time of year when people, if, if people are going to district goals a lot, yeah. on the very front page, if you won't even have to go to the board, right. to the leadership, to goals, it's it. right there. Mm -hmm. So it in real time curates what people are looking for in our community mm -hmm. and makes it the most accessible. Um, so I think that'll be helpful yeah. to Well, to we achieve. know for a fact that public comments last month were, was talking about people go here and they look at our ratings and they look at that mm -hmm. and what are, I think they're looking and I think if we make it simple for them and say, hey, these are our goals for our district, um, safety, and I think that that would stand out for them. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. And, and what you're describing is there, but it, it takes multiple steps to get there. You need yeah. to know where it's at as opposed to it being just super accessible right. and packaged in a way that's really easy to read and understand. Um, <clears throat> and it's empty but right now because why? Well, I'm not really sure. Uh, yeah, I don't so, know. Yeah, you just, as far as I, that it's not done working it before. there. Yeah. It's not the first time it's done it, but with it right just in, in, prepare, in, in preparing for this meeting, I looked at you know several and then I looked at Tassie's, but then when I looked at ours, it says, no yeah. previews. The, the tab is there. It says district goals and performance objectives. <clears throat> and there's nothing, nothing there. Yeah, from the past. There's nothing There's nothing historically there right. or, or currently for this past year. Right. It's not there. Yeah, so maybe it, it nested in a different area, and so that's, that's, that's a problem with yeah. the way it's organized. I've got a question. So for learning for myself, this is the first time that I've sat on one of these, right? And, and so uh, doing some study about the school board goals for the district, do, does the school board, do we set the goals and you guys set goals? And the way I would reading it and, and trying to understand is they're supposed to kind of align, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but in the past, did, who, who set the goals for, for the board, I guess is my question. Yeah, so the, the board, um, and this this is all subject to re, re, you know, re, reimagining, right? Mm -hmm. um, so there's some, so there's been historically times when the board has had a series of goals Maybe they've established four priorities and established goals within those priorities and then handed them to us and said, now execute them. Right. Um, and then there was a time um, where this board went through an exercise and said, you know, really, when we get upstream enough, what we really expect is an exceptional learning environment for every kid, every minute, every day. Yes. And, and the, the, depending on what the context is each year, exceptional learning environment may change, we may change what that means. Mm -hmm. And then you guys execute it. So when it, when, it, when it comes down to unpacking the data through the CG process, it indicates in every area of the organization, from teaching and learning to staff and human resources, um, to partnerships that need to support us with things like, um, you know, student trauma or um, you know, high quality instructional materials, you know, teacher coaching, 
you know, data may indicate those are areas we need to prioritize uh, in partnerships. And then in our operations and fiscal management, data indicates where there's some hot spots. And in order to make progress towards realizing an exceptional learning environment for every kid every day, we have to go through a process to indicate what that means. Where, where are the hot spots in the entire organization that need to come together and improve so that we are more likely to make progress towards the utopic reality of every kid, every minute, every day is going to have an exceptional learning environment. Yeah. So, you, so guys, you guys came up with this, because like I said, I'm, I'm new and I'm trying to learn, so you guys came up together, the team. Well, the, the, piece for, the, okay. the board. Yeah, I mean, I, I love yeah, you. Yeah, so the previous I'm board. I'm just trying to learn. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, no. So the, the exceptional learning environment for every student every day has been the board goal that has been readopted since prior to me being superintendent. Gotcha. The four, mission, I yeah, think it's a great question. Down, yeah. So then to kind of try and operationalize that, what's happened in the last seven years is it's evolved, we've evolved to, you know, breaking our organization into four priorities. That basically the entire school system can be um, cut into four slices of the pie, right? Teach and learning, human resources, partnerships, and, and operations. Um, and then we had to have a discipline process to determine what are the priorities that we need to focus on. Like, what does the data say? Like, we can't say, well, we feel like we got to do this better. Or we hear, you know, I heard the one teacher of 1600 complain about this, so that must be a priority. Well, it's, it's part of the narrative, but what does the data really say? What do surveys say? What does student performance data say? What does financial data say? You know, we've got to, when I say a discipline process, we can't go by field. And so the process takes us through um, what the data indicates and then lifts up, helps us curate of the 10 things that we got to fix in finance, what are the two or three highest leverage that we want to really move the needle on because you can't do everything. Mm -hmm. um, and then this is where we bring today, this is what we discovered. This is the best thinking of all of our people to get closer to realizing an exceptional learning environment for every, every student every minute, every day. And so this represents the best thinking of what is a culmination of about four months' worth of discipline work. Yeah. And, and the I last two you. days were about 10 hours of, okay, we're not playing now. Now let's sharpen the pencil and let's, let's nip and prune and focus and say, all right, because we started with, like we wanted to, to fix the whole course. And then we had to have a lot of debate and a lot of, Negotiation and a lot of revisiting the data. So I, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to make light of what it took to get here. Of course not. Um, I'm just thinking, like if if we gave you specifically you goals, right? We gave you goals, and uh, one of them was we want our math scores specifically to go up by five percent. And then we come back the next year and they didn't. Our question to you for support for you and what you need for your team and our students is what do what do we need what do you need from us? What do we need to improve? That was one of the sessions that I took. Mm -hmm. That was a question that I asked because they kept saying, Well, what can we do for our superintendent? Well, what can we do for you? You know what I'm saying? Like Are we doing enough as a board. Yeah. Yeah, so in the um, yeah, that's 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 kind of a line of what we tried to do. I think there's room to do it better possibly. Well, I don't think um, better, I think just more, but like, like if you guys give some detail, like it's amazing. So like when you look in this, yeah, like when you look in this packet, uh, each of the four priorities are there. So essentially my goals that you guys have adopted are, are the annual results measures for the district. So when you go in there and you look at priority one, it'll have very specific, and this year they're even more specific. Like, yeah. It needs to see you're better, yeah. and it has specific performance numbers. So then, when when I present this packet next year, you're going to look at that and the real numbers. And you say, "Well, Mr. Superintendent, you exceeded that. You all exceeded that, or you fell quite, you know, really short of that." And I'm going to have some feedback at the bottom of there, which you'll see in here, that says, "You know, in business operations and finance, this contributed to helping or hurting that. In student community engagement, we did these things, and it seemed to contribute to it, or we fell short." You know, it didn't work like we thought. Um, and then, in the evaluation, those discussions can mean, well, is there something else that we could be doing to support you? Right. Or is there, what do you think 
Like, what do you need? What else do you think you you, you, right. you need or could have done? What could be changed or yeah. implemented? That's kind of where I'm coming from too is, is, is helping you. So you guys, do, I've been in some budget meetings. I've been in some goal setting uh, with CPS, multi-billion dollar companies. You guys are By far exceed that with these presentations and the, the details that you give. Uh, so that's commendable. I just want to make sure that I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing and enough, right? Getting involved enough. I don't know if you can tell, I'm kind of hands on. Yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> uh, so hopefully, hopefully that's not a negative, but. Um, well, and the other thing, yeah, the other thing I would ask, you know, and I, I'll continue to ask is, do you get too much information or too little, right? Because yeah. most of my colleagues look at this and go, what the hell are you doing? You're giving way too much information. You're like giving them under the hood information about what goes on in every closet of the school district. And our board would, would drown. Like they just want one page with four goals and did you need to check yes or no? And that's what they want. This is what my colleagues say. And, and at least in my time here, you know, the feedback I keep getting is we don't we really appreciate that the, the district's an open book and we have, uh, you know, access to, to everything that's going on. Good, bad, nothing. Um, and so, um, you know, we'll, we'll, I'll definitely, hopefully, you know, this is useful to you. And of course, at the evaluation, you know, we'll, we can certainly talk about what might make it even better for you guys to feel like you're, um, you know, giving me clarity in the direction and that I'm providing you enough information mm -hmm. to know if you're providing the right kind of support. Um, yeah. So, yeah, right, definitely, you know, it's an iterative process. Right. All in the interest of Students. keep moving forward. I think for me, uh, Emilio, we used to have several, uh, just to help out a little bit, there was so many goals, the board had so many, mm -hmm. and then I believe it was some time way back with, with Steve, and I don't remember who all was here, but we came up with this one to encompass or umbrella all of the things that we wanted to see happen. And then what I tried to remember in my mind was that we broke them into these priorities which covered our different parts of our you know, our, our curriculum, our workforce, you know, which is the human resource, so on and so forth. And we share this with Roland, and then he goes down and shares it with his leadership, and then hopefully it trickles down to the campuses. And then, based on all the scores, I'm, in my mind, I told myself, well, eventually we're going to see it come roll back up. You know, it rolls right, down. Where it's and, measurable. And, yeah. Right, and then finally we get to see everything that we've shared that we want to see happen. He makes sure that it gets out to the right places and that it's um, that it's done, you know. And then hopefully we see it trickle back to us in our scores and all that kind of stuff. But it was really confusing for me, and sometimes still is, you know, how all of it's put together. Because like you say, it's a ton of stuff that they have to do for us, you know, to look at. Uh, but anyway, uh, they just yeah. ask you, yeah. like this happy, yeah. they they um, kind of just advise you to do. When you're um, developing your goals, thinking it, of each goal using the SMART criteria. So, mm -hmm. and measurable is definitely something that people look at and that you can reach mm -hmm. or fail at. Yeah. You know? yeah. So, you know. I like seeing these four here. These are good priorities mm -hmm. and it makes it easy for people to see that we're taking yeah. care of. I just think that maybe we should have for sure safety and security because that's been. Where would that be under a priority, Mr. McKay? Safety and security. <laughs> Uh, Who would that fall? Probably in their operation. Okay. Or it could be, it actually could be priority one teaching and learning just to provide safe. Mm -hmm. uh, I can look kind of, wow, kind of really? quite a bit, actually. Yeah. Well, mean, a lot, some districts too have okay, goals yeah. and then they have the priorities yeah, like in the mix. So we can still teach those. This is great. But just what are what are our goals for our district? Is, of course, to keep all yeah, the students safe and secure. So I can think I can answer. So on Monday, when the, the um, agenda is posted, one of the titles is going to be district and campus are um, annual results measures. Mm -hmm. And in there, there's gonna be a link. If you click on that, it will it will have the district goals that you're talking about. They're all smart. Oh, uh, it went, yeah. Yes, they're all smart, they're all written in there. And so there are like four for, the, for teaching and learning. Um, there's two, I think, so there's like six or seven total. And um, I think they, they're all, they answer what you're, you're looking for. Mm -hmm. They'll be there for the district, 
and then there's a there's a separate attachment there that has tabs at the bottom in a spreadsheet, and they're for each campus. Mm -hmm. So you'll have one link for the district, and then one link for the campuses on two different um, cover sheets. Okay. And they're all written in smart format. They're all can measurable. Can that be put on this page? You know what I'm saying? How, how can we get that yeah, so on this page? Yes, yeah, so that's yes, it is. So, um, what, uh, can I tell you one more thing? And I can go show it to you if you want, but um, that page, so you went, to the, you went to the board page, and for whatever reason, um, that is not up to date. If you go to required postings, so if you go up to about the district and go to required postings, it's linked it's like there. Okay. Yeah, but that that's what I was referring correct. to. It's there, but it's not in a place that why. is just okay. easily yeah. accessible. Yeah. Okay. Right. That's so if right. you don't know that you got to go to require yeah, posting, curriculum yeah. toolkit, yeah. that's right. CG, tabs on the bottom. Well, when I first yeah. uh, was appointed, yeah. I wanted to dive in and, and say, well, I'm, re I'm taking all these courses. Okay, yeah. I'm like, what are our district goals? And I'm like. What are our district goals? You know, and then uh, the board operating procedures are there. We're, we're going to tweak them or whatever. Yeah. But um, something that is easy to read and here that's are our goals. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. If you click okay. on, so I can come over and show you after where sure. it is. If you go to required postings, and I already texted Brandon and sent him. Oh man, that. I've already done Save it. Save me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I sent him that link and just said, "Hey, will you fix this link and put this link oh. there instead?" So I'm sorry about that. No, we'll, we'll get it fixed. I'm glad you found it. Well, it's okay. I just I want to make sure that if I'm not a board member and I'm a parent and I'm not wanting to go to, so we'll get it fixed. What are what are the district goals? We're, we get we get really excited when people want to dive into the work and um, see what no, we're doing. Yeah, it's yeah, good. Yeah. 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 They pretend to know. It's exciting. There's lots of work going on. Yeah, every every additional click, you lose about thirty percent of people. <laughs> no, no, I, I, I'm I'm a two click guy. If it's only two clicks, I'm not I'm not going there. Motor base, motor base, motor base. That's a lot of clicks. Okay. That's a lot of clicks. Right. I'm starting around. When I'm clicking, no, no. I tell people yeah. I'm thank you clicking so much. It takes a lot of clicking. Oh, it does. Yeah, thank you all so much for all that uh, yeah. dialogue. That that really helps us a lot. Yeah. All right. We done. That's huh? what we got. A little, yeah. All right. Motion for adjournment. So moved. Second. Second. Who seconded? Uh, Dale. How many? Me. All in favor? Yeah. All opposed? Me. Motion carried.